U.S. preparedness for dealing with a chemical or biological attack was the topic of a hearing Tuesday on Capitol Hill. A House Government Reform Subcommittee heard from Defense Department Inspector General Joseph Schmitz, General Accounting Office officials, and others. Connecticut Congressman Christopher Shays chairs this four-hour hearing. Before I'm being present, the Subcommittee on National Security, Veterans Affairs, and International Relations hearing entitled Chemical and Biological Equipment Preparing for a Toxic Battlefield is called to order. In the event U.S. forces are called upon to rid the world of the grave and growing threat posed by the current Iraqi regime, it must be assumed those men and women will face chemical and biological weapons. That prospect compels us to ask, are we ready to fight and prevail on a contaminated battlefield? That question has vexed Pentagon planners and congressional committees since the Persian Gulf War. According to the Department of Defense, DOD, after action analysis, shortcomings in the availability, suitability, and durability of chemical and biological CV defense equipment, particularly protective suits and masks, left combat troops avoidably vulnerable to unconventional attack in Operation Desert Storm. Despite prolonged and costly efforts to improve CB defense doctrine, tactics, and material, seemingly intractable problems still plague the effort to defend against chemical and biological weapons attacks. Research and development remains unfocused and in some instances duplicative. Procurements are behind schedule. Due to persistent inventory management weaknesses, DOD does not always know how many CB defense items are available where they are, or when they will get to the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who need them. Old protective suits are expiring faster than the next generation suits are being produced, pointing to a potential shortage through most of this decade. Compounding the problem, overall inventory visibility remains so poor, some units have sold new suits on the internet as excess, while other units are forced to delay critical training because they can't get the same suits. A Byzantine management structure wastes time and money and allows the Army, Navy, and Air Force to maintain service-specific approaches at the expense of a truly joint effort. Some of these problems are endemic to any CB defense effort. Protective suits have always been too hot, masks prone to leak, collective protective shelters were deemed inadequate, decontamination systems required too much water, Detectors sounded false alarms too often, and medical antidotes were not trusted. These old complaints reflect the harshest reality confronted on the modern battlefield. There is no absolute immunity to biological or chemical attack. Nevertheless, having rightly renounced in-kind retaliation capabilities, the key to CB deterrence is CB defense. U.S. personal personnel must be the best equipped and best prepared for us on Earth to en enable them to survive, fight, and win on a chemical and biological battlefield. One important lesson learned in the Gulf War should inform our discussion today. CB defense is a tactical, not a strategic, consideration. Contamination avoidance and other force protection capabilities shape how U.S. forces pursue their mission, not whether their, that mission is in our national interest. As one Gulf War analyst put it, having looked into the eyes of the dragon in the Iraqi desert, military planners cannot rely on nuclear deterrence or mere luck to avoid CB attack. We must constantly reevaluate the threat and reform our defenses against it. Two years ago, this subcommittee heard testimony from the General Accounting Office, GAO, the DOD Inspector General, and key Pentagon officials in the status of the Chemical and Biological Defense Program. We told them then we would invite them back to describe progress and problems meeting their own performance goals. Whether the threat emanates from Iraq, Iran, North Korea, or subnational terrorist groups, their answers are of vital importance to our national security. 
This open hearing will be followed by a closed session to allow members to question our witnesses on classified aspects of the CB defense program. While I understand the imperative to protect sensitive material, I have been concerned for some time that excessive classification of information in this area has done unconscionable damage to reform efforts. Failure to declassify IG reports on gas mask failures in the Gulf War era allowed the problem to fester for years behind a bureaucratic fog. The frank as possible discussion of the challenges we face, short of telegraphing actual vulnerabilities to a potential enemy, is an essential element of, of an effective CB defense program. In that spirit, we welcome our very distinguished witnesses. Uh, we look forward to their testimony, and we thank them from the bottom of our hearts for their service to our country during these very troubled times. At this time, I recognize um, my uh, colleague, uh, a very active member uh, and partner in the work of this committee, the ranking member, Dennis Kucinich. I want to thank the uh, chair for calling this hearing and to indicate my willingness to to work with you on these issues that are so important to our national security. On September 18th, General Myers, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, testified before the Armed Services Committee. He was asked, under oath, whether the Pentagon was prepared to handle a chemical or biological attack by Iraq. In response, he made the following assertion, and I quote, Obviously, our forces prepare for that, they train for that, and they would be ready to deal with that type of environment, unquote. Today, the Inspector General of the Department of Defense and the U.S. General Accounting Office are issuing independent reports detailing a host of new and disturbing findings about the inability of the Department of Defense to protect service members against chemical and biological attacks. These reports are not peripheral. They strike at the core of our servicemen and service women's ability to carry out their mission. And these reports were written by two agencies charged with providing independent and unbiased assessments. They also directly contradict the Department of Defense's public assertion of confidence. Now, unfortunately, the American public will never see these reports the country will not understand the true scope of these problems because the Department of Defense has classified those reports. Now, I can understand, on one hand, the rationale for classification, not wanting to reveal sensitive vulnerabilities to adversaries, not wanting to place the lives of <coughs> service members at risk. Those are important considerations. But under the circumstances, in order to protect our servicemen and service women, we have to look at the flip side of that argument. By denying the American people information that's critical to the safety of our sons and daughters who serve in the field. The Department of Defense may be placing servicemen and servicewomen at even greater risk. There are a great number of American families of servicemen and servicewomen who served this country during the last 
war in the Persian Gulf. And they understand based on the experience that their loved ones have had with what's called Gulf War Syndrome. There are many different circumstances and reasons why people could have developed the sensitivities that they did. One speculation is that U.S. bombs hit a munitions dump, which then exploded certain biologicals and chemicals that may have occasioned contact with our service personnel. Another is that possibility that such weapons were dispersed. But in any event, we know that American servicemen and service women were adversely affected and that they weren't protected and that the Department of Defense has not protected the people who served during the Gulf War. And there are families that have been devastated by this. So we have to come back to the moment and ask, what will we do to protect the servicemen and service women of this country before we get into such a conflict? The American people deserve to know the true dangers, which their sons and daughters could face. And up to now, up to now, the Department of Defense has downplayed those dangers. The Department of Defense wants it both ways. On one hand, it claims that we must take urgent, even unilateral, action against Iraq because we're told by some, although not conclusively confirmed by the CIA, that Iraq possesses chemical and biological weapons. Yet contrary to the last decade in which Iraq ref refrained from using chemical or biological weapons, there is a consensus that if the United States goes into Iraq with the purpose of regime change, Saddam Hussein will have nothing to lose by using whatever weapons he may have Now, obviously, in this case, inspections become of urgent concern. On the other hand, when it comes to the actual dangers our armed forces face, the Department of Defense has not been forthcoming. Administration officials say they're confident they have enough working protective gear to ensure the safety of our service members. Well, today, the myth is exposed. The classified reports need to be unclassified. The American people have a right to know the dangers that our young men and women could face. The American people have a right to know the preparedness of our military on matters of biological and chemical weapons conflict. The American people have a right to know whether or not there are serious deficiencies in equipment and inadequate and deficient training. Now, I'm forbidden from discussing the details of classified reports, but I will mention one unclassified example. We know that many protective suits that would be worn by our men and women who would serve in combat, many of those protective suits currently are in the field, and those suits are defective. Suits have holes in them. They have tears in the seams. They cannot protect against a chemical or biological attack. They would leave vulnerable the men and women out in the field. Now, although the suit manufacturer is now in prison, hundreds of thousands of these suits went out into the field they were given to service members throughout the world. They were provided to soldiers in Bosnia. And as of last year, the Pentagon, and this is on the record, this is already known, this is not classified. As of last year, the Pentagon could not account for a quarter of a million of such suits. It is public knowledge. The Department of Defense was unable to recall these suits because its inventory systems are very poor. 
the General Accounting Office reported that several military suits, or several military units, were selling brand new protective suits which cost $200 a piece over the internet for $3 each. As a result, there's a real possibility that in the near future, a young man or woman in the Persian Gulf may slip on one of these protective suits with a false promise of protection. Now, I'm sure that we will hear from the Department of Defense that systems are now in place to avoid such mistakes. However, this is the same department which has dragged its feet in first identifying the defective suits, the same department that refused to test all of the suits because of cost concerns, and the same department that refused to separate its inventories when suits, in fact, proved effective. I want to thank the chairman for holding this hearing, because this hearing is about national security. But it's also about whether we care about our servicemen and service women and the conditions that we would put them in. I am not going to have any serviceman or service women serving this country put them in harm's way and not make sure that they have every piece of equipment they need to protect them and to make sure that they can serve this country. I thank the chair. Thank you, gentlemen. We have Mr. Tierney. Mr. Tierney, thank you for being here. You've been a very active participant in this issue and have taken a keen interest in this particular hearing, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I hope whatever it is that you have for cold or whatever gets better soon. It's not like tough going there. Mr. Chairman, I think you know from correspondence that I've had with you in discussions that I have great concern about uh, the preparedness and the readiness of our troops to engage in the type of a conflict that may well uh, be uh, met in the Middle East. And, and one of the concerns I think many of us have about a unilateral preemptive strike without first uh, going through the international bodies and having our allies uh, work with us to try to accomplish the ends of uh, inspections and disarmament um, and then moving only as a last resort to uh, a military engagement. A lot of that stems from recent reports on the Millennium Challenge 2002, which were warf warfare simulation exercises that I, I wrote to you about and which were reported in a recent column in the New York Times uh, not very favorably, uh, and they raised great concern, and I'm somewhat concerned also that much of the information we're going to hear today about relevant factors are presumably going to come in a classified section of this hearing, and I think that when we're having a public discussion about what the future of this country is going to be in terms of going to war or not going to war and engaging the young men and women of our services, uh, the public ought to have uh, all the pertinent information that isn't truly in need of classification. And I oftentimes question uh, just why we classify much of the information, because once we get into those classified hearings, it seems that the public well should have uh, much of those facts. But the reports of this simulation, a simulated exercise, uh, indice indicate that clearly any action we have <laughs> against Iraq wouldn't be a cakewalk, uh, for sure. The report, and I hope we get to the bottom of this, says that the war games were fiddled with in ways that raise questions about whether the government is returning to a Vietnam-style over-optimism and myopia. In fact, uh, Paul Van Riper, who was the retired Marine Lieutenant General who played the enemy's military commander during those exercises, was quoted as saying, there's an unfortunate culture developing in the American military that maybe should make you nervous. I don't see the rich intellectual discussions that we had after Vietnam. I see mostly slogans, cliches, and unreadable materials. And then General Van Wiper said the mood reminded him of the mindset in Vietnam, excessive faith in technology, inadequate appreciation of the fog of war, lack of understanding of the enemy, and simple hubris. I don't think we can afford hubris, Mr. Chairman. I think that we have to be absolutely certain that our troops are prepared, that all the equipment uh, that we give them to go into any situation is going to be effective uh, beyond question, and that we have to make sure that we are ready. These uh, reported exercises, again, indicate to us that before the 13,500 people participating in it, before the American forces in these games even arrived on the scene, they were sunk. Much of the American fleet was sunk. So in order to have the exercise go forward, they just resurrected them and started again. Uh, they also indicated they took away many of the options that we could expect a Saddam Hussein to use and didn't make them available to the enemy. Uh, and I understand, as this article indicated, that these are war games or war simulations, and obviously you want to learn as much as you can. I think what we need to find out today is, are we learning? Are we learning from whatever happened in there that was not good news? And are we going to take whatever action is necessary to make sure that our troops 
are properly equipped and well protected and that we go in the sequence in which we should go in moving forward on these issues of such import and that we're thoroughly prepared. So with those uh, comments, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the hearing and our witnesses and their testimony. Thank you. Thank you. If my uh, colleagues would just pr permit me to say that when we had the debate on whether or not to go into the Persian Gulf War, uh, it was a debate in which all members stated their views. We tried to get as much information as possible, and we f uh, were very respectful of each other's position, and I appreciate you raising the questions you have. Obviously, it is a bit awkward to have a a, a, a open hearing and then a declassified and, and then a classified one, but we decided to go with the open first and push as hard as we can to know what can be on the record and then uh, we'll leave the rest for the classified. In other words, we've, we've reversed this, the order that we usually do. And I just want to say that I, I would uh, have to believe that, uh, that everyone cares about obviously um, making sure our troops are protected. Um, but uh, there are questions about uh, frankly, um, how well they were protected in the Persian Gulf, as, as this committee and you all have, both of you have clearly pointed out. We have uh, two panels. We have Mr. Joseph Schmitz, Inspector General, Office of the Inspector General, Department of Defense, accompanied by Donald A. Bloomer, Program Director, Readiness Division, Office of the Inspector General, and David K. Steen Steensma, uh, Deputy Assistant Inspector General, Office of the Inspector General, Department of Defense. Uh, Mr. Smith will testify. And then we have uh, from the GAO, Mr. Raymond J. Decker, Director, Defense Capabilities and, and Management, U.S. General Accounting Office, accompanied by Mr. William W. Callwood, Assistant Director, Defense Capabilities and Management, U.S. General Accounting Office. Um, we will uh, follow this process. Uh, we'll, you'll see the five-minute light. We allow you to go on another five minutes, but we're not trying to encourage you to fill the full ten minutes. Uh, we'd like you to stop clearly before then, but you, you, if you deem it necessary, the issue is too important, and my colleagues and I understand that and uh, would want you to be able to <coughs> make your points as you need to make them, but we would prefer that they be uh, five minutes uh, and then run over another five, but not clearly to ten total. Uh, at this time, let me just take care of some housekeeping. I ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose and without objection so ordered. I ask further unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record without objection so ordered. Uh, at this time, I would ask uh, the gentlemen uh, who are testifying and accompany the testifiers to stand up. If there's anyone else that may be responding to a question, I'd like them to stand up in this first panel. Uh, are we pretty complete with the five of us here? Okay, if you'd raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Note for the record, our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. Mr. Smith, uh, we're going to start you off, and uh, then we're going to go to Mr. Kucinich for the first uh, round of questions, and I'll go, and then Mr. Tierney, unless there's another of my colleagues who come. Uh, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, I'm going to make another request, and I'm sorry to interrupt you before you just said one word. Uh, for some reason, we don't have a very good cooling system, though I think it's getting a little better, but uh, our amplification is not so terrific. The silver is what mic is what amplifies. The uh, black mic is what um, is part of C-SPAN, and obviously both are important. Just want you to speak fairly loudly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking Member Kucinich, Mr. Turney. Um, this is the second opportunity I've had to appear before this committee, the subcommittee, and I'm grateful for uh, the previous and this opportunity uh, to address your questions regarding the status of individual protective equipment intended to protect our armed forces from chemical and biological attack. I share your concerns with respect to the department's inventories, quality controls, and serviceability of individual protective equipment. In our open session, I want to present our observations related to the need for an inventory management tool at the unit level that contains the essential elements needed for chemical and biological defense material, improvements in readiness reporting, and training challenges. Let me thank, at the onset, whoever brought this World War I-era Army poster here to the hearing. 
because it reminds me of the fact that my own grandfather was gassed by the Germans on a battlefield in France during World War I. I'm told, I'm not, I don't know for sure whether it was because of a defective gas mask or whether he even had a gas mask, but I'm told that uh, he ultimately died from residual effects of this gas. This is a vital issue, and I sincerely hope that the audits my office has conducted in this area meaningfully assist this committee, the Congress, and the warfighters in improving our readiness. The Department has a very comprehensive program to provide world-class chemical and biological defense capabilities. These capabilities allow the armed forces of the United States to survive and successfully complete their operational missions ac across the spectrum of conflicts. Our armed forces must be prepared to execute their missions in all types of environments, including those that are chemically and biologically contaminated. The Department must maintain an active, viable chemical and biological defense program in order to protect its forces. In his annual report to the President and to Congress, the Secretary of Defense stated that, quote, the proliferation of NBC technology, materiel, and expertise has provided potential adversaries with the means to challenge directly the safety and security of the United States and its allies and friends, close quote. As a result of various reviews, my office has made efforts to address the availability and serviceability of the chemical and biological defense material issued to the armed forces. Since the last appearance before this subcommittee in June 2000, the Office of the Inspector General has continued its efforts to ensure that the chemical and biological defense equipment issued to the armed forces has been adequately maintained and stored and that all personnel requiring chemical and biological defense equipment have it and are properly trained to use it. Two audits we have conducted address issues your invitation letter specifically requested me to discuss, Mr. Chairman. Because States, one U.S. territory, and nine countries under the command of two unified commands, eight active duty component commands, four reserve component commands, and the Army and Air National Guard to review their management of chemical and biological defense resources. The results of our work are based on what we have seen in the military units most likely to encounter in chemical and biological attack. The problems that we identified in those unit visits can be corrected. The issues are not insurmountable. Solving the problem will require a concerted effort at all levels of command in each of the services and in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Some commands, such as the U.S. Naval Forces Central Command, have established vigorous programs to protect personnel from chemical and bi biological weapons. Other organizations have less robust programs that need to be improved. I will discuss those programs in greater detail later in the closed session. Limited visibility of chemical and biological defense items as assets remains a problem at the installation or user level because of the lack of automated inventory tracking systems at that level. Each of the services maintains their own inventory management tool. These tools are often augmented at the local installation level with other tools usually locally developed or produced that provide a detailed view of the stocks of chemical and biological defense equipment. The tools are systems that should contain, at a minimum, information such as stock number, size, contract number, lot number, date of manufacture, date of expiration, date of inspection, the individual issued the item, and any service bulletins or recall notices. There should not be a need to develop inventory management tools at the installation level. For example, one Navy activity reported to us that they spent $15,000 to develop an Excel spreadsheet, while another Navy activity I'd, I'd identified an expenditure of roughly $100,000 to develop and field their chemical and biological defense equipment inventory tool. Although these expenditures might seem small on an individual basis, the fact that commanders identified a need to develop their own tools should highlight the need for a department-wide standardized inventory tool. 
The Department has worked to standardize other issues related to chemical and biological defense, and it can do so here as well. Standardizing an automated inventory management tool would provide department-wide benefits. This would not even require developing a new inventory tool because some of the tools already in use could be adapted to the other services. For example, the Mobility Inventory and Control Accountability System currently used throughout the Air Force provides a level of detail that units in each of the services have identified would aid them in managing their inventories. This system is used to maintain control of inventory and can be used to identify materials on hand that would have been flagged for inspection because of the service notices or product recalls, such as the one for defective overgarments. The system also assists in managing on-hand stocks with an identified shelf life for tracking by tracking lot numbers or dates of manufacture. The question then becomes one of who should be the one to enforce standardization. We believe the Office of the Deputy Assistant to the Secretary of Defense for Chemical and Biological Defense should provide the oversight department-wide and should be responsible for initi initiatives such as this. We have recommended that the Deputy Assistant develop and field a DOD standardized inventory management system for all items of chemical and biological defense. In response to our recommendation, the Deputy Assistant agreed that the services and the Defense Logistics Agency have numerous inventory management systems with limited ability to share information. The Deputy Assistant pointed out that DOD was established has established a single focus point for gathering and disseminating data for the new Joint Service Lightweight Integrated Suit Technology ensembles and that the Defense Logistics Agency is actively involved in replacing legacy systems with one that will interface with the services systems beginning in 2005. We have conveyed to the Deputy Assistant that 2005 is too long to wait. A standard inventory tool at the insta installation level for chemical and biological defense equipment is needed now for the units to effectively manage their equipment. The Army can enhance the preparedness of our forces relative to chemical and biological you defense. You need to uh, start to think about wrapping up here. I'm very close to my conclusion. Okay. Through an improved unit readiness reporting system, the Army attempted to provide better information on chemical and biological defense preparedness when they revised their readiness reporting instruction in November 2001, but additional improvements can still be made. As a result of our work with the Army National Guard and Army Reserve, we recommended that the Army revise their instruction for reporting readiness and include reporting of chemical and biological defense materials for all Army units. The Army agreed to our recommendation. Improved reporting of chemical and biological defense readiness will aid in creating a climate at all Army levels where training and equipping forces for chemical and biological defense receive higher levels of attention and resources. I will go into greater detail on the issue we identified in the units we visited in my testimony for the closed session. For this session, I would like to state that each of the services as a comprehensive training program that they believe will prepare their personnel to survive and operate in a chemically and biologically contaminated environment. I believe that they have put in place the foundation on which programs can be built that will provide for the protection and survivability of their personnel. The Marine Corps and Air Force training were more robust than the Army and the Navy programs. Each of the services ensures that all personnel receive chemical and biological programs. Each of the services ensures that all personnel receive chemical and biological defense training when they enter the service. Sorry, I need to have you stop. That's fine. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me just uh, clarify f uh, for the purposes of our question before we get on to Mr. Decker. Um, you didn't touch on a number of points that I think are even more significant than what you talked about, such as the risk factors and so on. Uh, when we start asking questions about uh, your uh, public document, are you going to be saying to us that some of that information uh, will have to be behind closed doors? No, if it's in the public document. Okay. Well, then there, there are questions about analysis. If A and B <coughs> equals something and, and C equals B, I just want to make sure we can pursue those points. Okay? That's precisely why I have two technical experts sitting on okay. each side of me. Mr. Well, they're going to be used. Mr. Decker. 
I'd love it if you could be a little more vivacious. This is, uh, is going to be a long day. I need some <clears throat> variation in the voice, a little excitement. Okay, Mr. I'll, Decker. I'll try, Mr. Chairman. All right. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, uh, I'm joined today by Mr. K. Wood, uh, my expert assistant director on these issues. We are pleased to be here today to discuss the Department <coughs> of Defense's continuing efforts to protect U.S. forces against chemical and biological attack. DOD believes it is increasingly likely that an adversary will use a chemical or biological weapons against U.S. forces to degrade our superior U.S. conventional warfare capabilities placing service members' lives and effective military operations at risk. Currently, more than 20 states or non-state groups either have or have an interest in acquiring chemical weapons, and approximately 12 countries are believed to have biological warfare programs. Terrorist groups are known to be interested in these weapons. Therefore, U.S. forces need to be properly trained and equipped to operate in a chemical and biologically contaminated environment. And as we have reported, when the threat of chemical and biological weapons use occurred during the Gulf War, deploying U.S. forces encountered a wide array of problems, including unsuitable and inadequate supplies of protective equipment, poor training, and unsatisfactory chemical and biological detectors. During the past seven years, at the request of Congress, especially this subcommittee, we have examined this important issue and produced over 30 reports and statements while we found that DOD has made some improvements in equipment, training, and readiness reporting, we are continuing to have concerns in each of these areas. In 1996, we issued a major report to discuss the overall capability of the U.S. forces to fight and survive in a contaminated environment. We reported that DOD was slow in responding to lessons learned during the Gulf War of 1991. Specifically, each Early deploying units like required equipment, such as chemical detector paper, decontamination kits, and sufficient quantities of protective equipment. Army and Marine Corps forces remain inadequately trained for effective chemical and biological defense. Joint exercises included little or no chemical and biological defense training. Army medical units often lacked the chemical and biological defense equipment and training. Research and development was slower than planned, and unit reporting on these issues and readiness was unsatisfactory. We concluded that these issues were persistent and, if not addressed, will likely result in needless casualties and a degradation of U.S. warfighting capability. We noted that despite DOD's increased emphasis on chemical and biological defense, it continued to receive a lower priority than traditional mission tasks at all levels of command. Many field commanders told us that they accepted a level of chemical and biological defense unpreparedness as they tried to balance priorities and budgets. In 2000, we looked at this issue again at the early deploying forces and we saw a better picture. We reviewed three Army divisions, two Air Force fighter wings, and one Marine Corps expeditionary force and found that most of these units had the required individual protective equipment necessary and most detection and decontamination equipment. This is a positive. Officials at the units, however, said that had shortages, that the shortages would be filled from stocks held later for later deployers or from war reserves and had not determined whether this solution would satisfy their needs nor would it have an impact, a negative impact, on the future deployments and our war reserves. Training continues to be a problem. 1996, the commanders were not integrating chemical and biological defense into unit, unit exercises, and the training was not realistic. For example, Marine Corps commanders did not fully integrate chemical and biological defense into unit exercises as required by Marine Corps policy because operating in the protective equipment is difficult, it's time consuming, decreases the number of essential tasks that can be formed during an exercise and limits the offensive capability during these operations. Officials stated that chemical and biological defense training is still being adversely impacted by the shortage of specialists in these units. We also report that DOD's monitoring of the chemical biological defense readiness in our 1996 report had improved. By 2000, based on our recommendation, the Joint Chiefs of Staff directed changes to the status of reports training system, SORTS. 
that will require re units to report more clearly on the quantity and chemical biological equipment on hand and training readiness. However, we noted that the changes do not require that units report on the condition of the chemical gear. Thus, the reports could indicate that the unit has the equipment, but it may not be serviceable. So allow me to focus on a major issue of this hearing, and that is the, the protective suits that um, uh, we have a, a chart that we're going to put up. Individual protection is critically important component of overall chemical and biological defense. This is the last line of defense for our service members. Like the DODIG, we have concluded several recent reviews on this topic. If I may direct your attention to this chart, which is on my right and also on page 10 of the prepared statement. It depicts the number in millions of older BDO suits in dark and the newer Joint Service Lightweight Integrated Suit Technology, the JS List suits in white, from 2001 to 2007. The dotted lines represent different requirements. For instance, the horizontal dashed line is the number of suits required for two major theater wars. The dotted dash line is for 150 percent of one major theater war. Although DOD seems to be moving from the two MTW to the one and a half MTW, suit shortages are protected to, projected to escalate in the next few years because the majority of the suits in the current inventory will end their shelf life and expire by 2007. And the new suits coming in the JS list are not entering the inventory quickly enough to cover the degrading older suits. As a result, in August of, three, of, of 2002, DOD had procured about 1.5 million JS list suits, which have been issued to the military services. This, with the older suits, equals about 4.5 million suits. This level is now barely sufficient to meet the new requirement of 150 percent of one major theater war. If the new suit funding and the production do not increase sufficiently to replace the expiring suits, the inventory will drop each year all the way out to 2007. We've testified, and this was covered again by Mr. Kucinich earlier, <coughs> about serious deficiencies in inventory management. The DODIG has done the same. Uh, the point that I would make here is that 250,000 suits that were defective, Israel Tech suits, are still unaccounted for. We have not seen evidence that they have been found. Over the last seven years, we've highlighted a serious gap between the priority given chemical and biological defense and the actual implementation of the program. The, the quadrennial defense reviews of 97 and 2001 identify chem and bio defense as key priorities. Although the program overall is clearly improved, many of the problems are that we previously reported are still unresolved. Let me focus on the budget. DOD has requested almost $1.4 billion for the Chemical and Biological Defense Program 2003. However, it should be noted, $400 million of that is for the Office of Homeland Security Biodefense efforts. Despite the emphasis placed on this program by the Quadrennial Defense Review and statements about the threat of weapons of mass destruction by senior officials, the program has consistently had difficulty competing against other service priorities, such as those associated with traditional mission tasks. Spending on chem bio defense program represents one third of one percent of the defense, the entire defense budget. In summary, DOD has made many improvements over the years to defend against and sustain operations in a chemical environment. These gains have been primarily in the areas of equipment, training, and readiness reporting. DOD has concurred or partially concurred with 36 of our 37 recommendations in our reports. DOD recognizes that management and organization of the program must improve and has recently proposed organization and other changes designed to address these shortcomings. However, a real gap exists between the priority and emphasis given chemical and biological defense by DOD and the actual implementation of the program. We are concerned that without leadership commitment of the department to address long-term conditions, we have identified survival of our service members operating in a contaminated environment and the success of our operations are at risk. We would be pleased to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. And before calling to Mr. Kucinich, I just mentioned to Mr. Kucinich that I just wanted to make a few points. Uh, we, after the Gulf War, which I supported, uh, we, we had men and women who came back um, convinced that they were um, 
negatively impacted by their service to our country in, in, in the Gulf War and that they were ill. Uh, eventually, uh, we identified about 70,000 men and women who came home ill. And I became chairman of the Human Resource Committee in 95, where we had jurisdiction of the Department of Veterans Affairs. And we began intense hearings where Mr. Tierney, Mr. Kucinich also became involved during the course of the years that followed. Uh, I want to say on the record that when we talk about this issue, it's a very sensitive issue, not just in terms of, in terms of national security, but it's sensitive to me because uh, I feel, have felt that we have never really, uh, until recently, had honest answers from the Department of Defense. For instance, there were questions of whether our troops were exposed to uh, chemical weapons. The Department of Defense would say, uh, they were not uh, exposed to offensive chemical weapons. We never picked up the word until we had a gentleman who came and testified before our committee and came with a video of, as they blew up Camasilla, and he had pictures of, of uh, videos of the blowing up of Camasilla, but also some of the canisters of chemicals and the shells of chemicals and the, and the rockets that had chemicals in them, which we blew up. Uh, we announced we were going to have that hearing on Tuesday uh, the week before, and DOD announced at 12 o'clock they were going to have a press conference at 4 o'clock, in which they then had a press conference announcing our troops were exposed to defensive use of chemicals. Frankly, we didn't see much of a difference, uh, but I guess offensive and defensive was the way the DOD was able to be um, technically uh, correct in the answer to our questions. So it made us realize that we had to dig deeper. During the course of these hearings as well, we learned that some protective headgear, excuse me, masks, uh, did not meet the manufacturer's uh, specs. They just, 35 of one mask didn't and 45 of another, approximately 45, were defective, brand new, in terms of meeting the level. It took us about eight or nine years to have that report uh, declassified. And what was troubling to me was that I knew that our troops during the course of this time would potentially be engaged in other combat missions. And I knew that there was a real debate in the DOD about whether these masks would really do the jobs that are required. Now, I understand the DOD was taking issue with uh, the Inspector General, I think it was the Inspector General's report, about the, the viability of these masks. But I just put on the record that um, Every member up here has to decide whether or not to send our troops to war. And um, we have to live with it. And for me, it becomes particularly sensitive because I was in the Peace Corps and a conscientious objector uh, and wasn't in Vietnam. And now I'm being asked to decide whether people risk their lives. And I'll say for the record, just so I can get past that point, uh, I determined during the Gulf War that I had to know what our mission was, that I had to know what our strategy was, that I had to know that we would use all the firepower necessary. Um, I first had to know what our national interest was, what our mission, what our strategy, and then know that we would use whatever firepower was necessary uh, to guarantee the success of our mission, and also, in the end, know whether our exit policy was total victory or whether it was something less and that we would then leave. I merely mention this because this is a very sensitive issue, and my colleagues in the port part of asking you questions are really trying to determine, I think, not just uh, whether we should uh, uh, confront Saddam Hussein, but if we do, uh, what are we asking our military personnel to do? And I'll just say, in conclusion, that I hope and pray that <clears throat> if, in fact, there are some vulnerabilities to our troops and they're still required to go in, that they at least are told their vulnerabilities, that they are at least told them. Um, maybe not the general public, maybe not the enemy, but at least uh, our own people. We'll have no illusions. And I thank my colleagues for the opportunity to just make that point. And um, Mr. Kucinich, you have the floor for 10 minutes. And then I'll go to either one of my colleagues uh, next, and then I'll go, and then, um, and then we'll go back. <coughs> you know, I, I think that the chair is well taken in his uh, prefatory remarks here, and I want to uh, express my appreciation for them. Because for me, it gets to the issue of you know, would the American people support action against Iraq 
which could put their sons and daughters in harm's way if they knew that there was a distinct possibility that their sons and daughters could go into combat with defective gear, with biological and chemical weapon suits that are supposed to protect them that don't work, that have holes in them, that have holes in the seams. I wonder if this isn't one of the reasons why the Department of Defense is classifying the information. And as we proceed here with the questions, Mr. Chairman, I want to say, as the ranking Democrat on this subcommittee that has oversight over national security, that I am very concerned about the reasons for classification of information relating to the safety of this protective gear and to the inability of the Department of Defense to determine where those quarter of a million, 250,000 <coughs> defective suits happen to be. Now, Mr. Chairman, you, you probably are familiar that yesterday something remarkable happened at the Pentagon's briefing room because what they did was to, um, for years, the media covering the Pentagon has been asking to see footage of engagement in Iraq's uh, northern and southern no-fly zones. And for years, these requests were denied. Well, Pentagon officials had said that showing such films would compromise intelligence, provide the enemy with valuable information about tactics and technology, and worst of all, endanger the pilots. Well, yesterday, what happened? The Pentagon showed several of these films. Engagements with Iraqi surface air missiles and other anti-aircraft uh, tapes were suddenly declassified. Now, I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering if uh, we're not getting here into the politics of classification. There's another element here, too. Now, I remember how proud this country was to see the challenger lift off the pad, and then how horrified we were when it blew up. And then in the subsequent investigations, I remember distinctly a discussion about concerns that were expressed in, in circles about these O-rings, about whether there, was, whether there was sufficient protection and whether the O-rings were ready for the launch. And we know what happened. So are we about to launch a a war against Iraq, where our, our troops are not protected. Now, and, and one final note before I get into the questions, Mr. Chairman. You know, if the Department of Defense is unwilling to be forthcoming on something so elementary as the safety of protective suits, suits that would protect our, our men and women, our sons and daughters, from a biological or chemical weapons attack. What other areas? What other areas are we not knowing about? Is this one of the reasons why some of our most esteemed generals are saying, don't go there, we're not ready? Mr. Schmitz. General Myers testified two weeks ago that the military is prepared to fight a chemical and biological, uh, in a chemical and biological weapons environment. <clears throat> they trained for it and ready to deal with it. I'd like to ask you about that. Based on your investigations, <clears throat> are there specific military units that are essentially completely unprotected against a potential chemical or biological attack? I think my, uh, my best answer, and I'll defer to my technical ac experts here because I've only been in the job for four months and most of the audits occurred before I took office, but my best answer is, is that the <clears throat> we have not um, concluded in our audits that there are any completely unprotected units. Uh, there's no such thing as complete protection in these type of issues. Um, we've identified areas of improvement, but... Um, I guess the, the straight answer to your question is, is no, I think is the way you phrased it. If you phrased it, are there any completely un unprotected units? 
Are there any completely unprotected? I don't units? believe we have identified any such. And did you find specific military units that do not currently have sufficient protective equipment to meet even minimum requirements established by the services to protect against a chemical or biological weapons attack? I think that question gets into the classified uh, discussion. I'll be perfectly glad to discuss that in detail okay, in the classified session. Okay, let me ask it again. So you said you think it does, and I, I want to ask it again just in case you think it doesn't. Did you find specific military units that do not currently have sufficient protective equipment to meet even minimum requirements to protect against a chemical or biological attack? I think that question, with all respect, is, is better for the closed session and I'll so be... So you're saying it's classified and you can't discuss it? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and let me also just clarify one thing. Um, the misuse of the classification system is a serious issue in my view. And I'd like to just say on the record that I classified this report. And, you, and, 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 and the allegation that the DOD is using the classification process, I mean, we go by the guidelines set by the DOD. And, you know, this is a very, very serious issue about protecting the lives of our uh, members of the armed forces. So, but if so you then, have a well, serious... That's, that's very interesting. Yes. So are you telling me that we should... Are you ready to tell the American people that their sons and daughters who may go into combat are going to be perfectly safe with the biological and chemical weapons suits that they'll be wearing? Are you ready to say that? What I said earlier is... I, just they, can you answer that question, Mr. Schmitz? The, the answer is no, because there is no such thing as perfect safety in warfare. Uh, you gave a no answer to my question, and I just, I, I thank you for being honest. No, can, can I just, uh, um, the, the issue is sensitive, and I do think a member should be able to respond to, to define what no means. Uh, otherwise, we could have a distortion, so. Well, if he wants to say what no means, I'm, you know, yeah. I think I mean, we're, we're in, a, we're in a, a city where no doesn't always mean no, and yes doesn't always mean yes. So what does your no mean? I'll defer to the classified, uh, the closed session, and I'll be glad to get it be perfectly forthright and even allow my technical experts to answer every single question you have, because I believe the American people are entitled to know, but I also take very, very seriously the proper utilization of classification. And if you have, uh, Mr. Ranking, if you have a, a, a serious allegation that somebody in the Department of Defense is I, misusing no, the wait classification process. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Mr. Chairman, this is inappropriate. No, no, he's not. This no. is inappropriate. I didn't make any allegations. I, I'm, based, I'm making statements based on your testimony. And you just told me that you can't answer the question. So, and I, and the, chairman came I'll retract back, my... the chairman came back and said, we want to know what no means. And you just told me, and the, no, no, anybody watching, that you can't say what no means. No, I, if, if, if the gentleman would... Sure. No, I don't think he was saying that. I, I, if, I, if, if you had that impression, he was, you wanted a yes or no answer, and he was just qualifying his no answer, just so we put it in perspective. And that's all I'm saying. I, I would not want to be up where he, these gentlemen are and, and have a yes or yo, a no or yes answer. I would want to be able to say yes or no and to be able to, to explain why. I'd also like to say, if I could, that there is so much information that is valuable and important on the record. I just want to make sure we don't lose the opportunity of getting what can be on the record on the record, besides also disclosing what can't be on the record. And I, I'm not taking it from the gentleman's time. I just want to say that uh, I hope that we put on as much information on the record as we can. And it's substantial. Well, I, I, might, I might add, Mr. Chairman, sure. and, and with, with the greatest respect for the chair, they're in a difficult position you're in a difficult position. If there's a single American serviceman or service woman who is out in the field with a defective suit, I think they're the ones who are in a difficult position. When you have a quarter million suits that haven't been located that are defective, they're the ones who could be in a difficult position. Now, Mr. Schmitz, again, um, are there specific military units that currently do not meet minimum required levels of training to protect against a chemical or biological attack. Mr. Ranking, let me just 
clarify one thing. I didn't mean to provoke an argument. I was actually making an this offer. Isn't, there's no argument here. We're all here for America, okay? I agree 100%. And I was making an offer to you that if you have a specific allegation about the Department of Defense misusing the classification system, my office is empowered by statute to look into that as an allegation. And I'm saying I would be glad to consider such an allegation and look into it. And that was a s sincere offer to you, Mr. Kucinich, to actually be of service. I, and, I, and I take that as an effort. I, I, I appreciate your, your assertion of sincerity. And I'm sincerely interested in finding out if there's any unsafe suits out there that are going to be worn by American servicemen and women. And that is an battle. issue that I am more than glad to get into any details you would like to get into at the classified session. See, th this is wrong. I just want to say that. This, I, I really feel this, Mr. Chairman, that this is wrong. That, that information that, that, that the American people need to know if their sons and daughters are going to be sent into battle with defective suits, that ought to be public knowledge. Let me just say this. Should we this. find out after it happens? Let me say this, and I believe this is proper to say in an open session. Our studies, our audits have found deficiencies. So the answer to your question generally is yes. The specifics are what I'm not prepared to get into in an open session because that essentially exposes vulnerabilities, and that's exactly why we have classification. We can't go there. Okay, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you giving me this opportunity to uh, ask the questions, and it is a matter of record that we had a yes answer, and it's also a matter of record that information that is classified uh, it could bear on the safety of our men and women in the field. Let me uh, say to all the panelists before calling on uh, either Mr. Tierney or I can go. If you're ready, Mr. Gilman, I could go with you, but I'd be happy to have you wait a little longer if you'd like to wait. Well, yeah. just, uh, I'd like to make a statement okay. and, and one okay. question. Well, we'll allow that. I, uh, it's going to be a long day today, and I, I want to assure all our witnesses um, that I don't want you to leave that table until you make sure the record is clear as to your position and you will be allowed to make sure that whatever you need to put on the record will be put on the record. I do not want this open hearing to not put on as much information as possible. So make notes of things that need to be clarified, defined, and so on. Um, I'd be happy to go to you, Mr. Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Chairman. Okay, but you don't, you're not going to be asking questions right yet? No. Well, I have one question. I'll, okay, I'll, well, I'll, you have 10 minutes, so. Is thank that, you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a statement and yeah, question. You have th ten minutes. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for. You have to speak a little louder. The mic system really stinks. Uh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for conducting this important hearing, and you've been conducting a number of important hearings with regard to our readiness and our uh, ability to respond to any crisis out there. Um, this is a timely and appropriate uh, hearing to examine the status of our Department of Defense chemical and biological defense programs. It takes on special importance given that it now appears inevitable that we're going to undertake some major military operations against Iraq in the near future. The last time American forces went in action against Iraq during the Gulf War in 91, they faced a battlefield that could be best described as a toxic soup of chemical and biological hazards. And while Saddam did not actively use chemical or biological agents against coalition forces, such weapons were forward deployed and a number of cases were destroyed by Allied bombardment. It was several years later that our subcommittee learned that the subsequent destruction of these chemical stockpiles that thousands of coalition troops were exposed to low levels of resident agents. Moreover, when combined with a haphazard and disorganized vaccine effort, smoke from the numerous oil well fires, from natural biological hazards indigenous to the region, and exposure to depleted uranium, it was no wonder that thousands of soldiers later found themselves suffering from various ailments and conditions related to that kind of exposure. I hope we've learned from that lesson. My concern today is the hazards facing our service members should we force a final confrontation with Saddam Hussein and his military 
facing removal from power, I fear he will have every incentive to use all of the various chemical and biological weapons at his disposal. And while respectful of the effort made by the UN weapons inspectors, I'm in no way confident that they were able to account for all of Saddam's weapons before they were forced out in 1998. Moreover, Saddam Hussein has clearly been busy in uh, building up his weapons armaments in the past four years. If this administration decides to commit the necessary force and treasure to overthrow the present government of Iraq, a decision that I would fully support, then it needs to ensure that those forces are prepared to face any contingency, including a desperate enemy with a history that's deployed chemical weapons in military operations in the past. I look forward to, uh, to hearing additional testimony from our witnesses with regard to these concerns, but let me pose a question for the panel. What has the Department of Defense done to improve the availability, the durability, and suitability of CB defense equipment since the 91 Gulf War? And secondly, what has the Department of Defense done to ensure deployed U.S. forces will not experience shortages in CB defense equipment? Mr. Schmitz and the panel. Yes, thank you, Mr. Gilman. Um, our audits indicate that each of the services has, in fact, uh, initiated a number of measures both in inventory control and training in order to improve and to learn on the lessons of the Gulf War. Is, is, that, that, your, is that your full answer? Well, I have much more details Please. in both my classified and unclassified reports. Well, tell, tell us some more about your unclassified. If, if I could, Mr. Gilman, I'd like to defer to the person that actually wrote the report and, and, and allow him. Well, that may be. Yeah, Let me Mr. just tell you, there's no problem in ever, if you ever need one of the experts yeah. to respond, you don't, you just do it. No, okay. okay. Mr. Bloomer, I'd like him to actually address the question directly. He's in much better position. All right. Well, we found that. Uh, Mr. Service. Bloomer, I, we want that mic a little closer to you. Okay. And let me just say, we want the people who know the answer to the question to answer the question, whoever that is. We found that the services had begun implementing more vigorous training programs. There are still improvements that can be made, uh, don't misunderstand me, but where we stand today versus where we stood at the conclusion of the Gulf War is, is much better in terms of the training programs that are in existence right now. And in terms of equipment availability, they've made, they've made great strides in providing equipment, but again, there are improvements that can still be made. What kind of improvements are still needed? I would defer to the afternoon session, if I may, for the classified discussion. Are you satisfied that the improvements that are being made are significant? Or is there some pretty serious needs to be fulfilled? They've made significant improvements, but there are still some needs that need to be fulfilled. And when and did they start bit. making the improvements? Pardon me? When did they start making the improvements that you're referring to? Uh, well, we've been working in this area since 1994, and we've seen them progress each year as, as we've gone through the process. So it's, it's been a continuous improvement. So working since 94, you still find that there are major improvements that have to be made. Is that correct? Yes. Does anyone else want to comment on my question? Um, let me say this, sir. The, uh, I can ask you to put the mic closer. Okay. Uh, one of the things that we would, is needed, and it's needed not for just this area, but almost every area in DOD, is they need a constant emphasis at all levels of command, from the lowest level up to the Secretary of Defense, that this is going to be a highest priority. And it's hard for every commander. He has different priorities he has to address every day. He has different levels of funding that he has available. Um, and he makes trade-offs every day. But uh, those commanders we've seen that have taken this on, such as the uh, naval commander in uh, Bahrain there, uh, and gave it the highest level of emphasis, that's where we've seen the greatest improvements. 
And what about other commanders besides the commander at Bahrain? Um, the Are they fulfilling your needs? Uh, the central commander, he wrote us a, a letter which Mr. Schmidt mentions in his testimony. Uh, he is uh, tremendously interested in this area. He thanked us for uh, the work we've done. Uh, he put heavy emphasis on his commanders to uh, improve any areas we found weaknesses in and to address it at, uh, I believe he also said, at all levels of command. <coughs> So are other commanders following that kind of advice? Are other commanders following that? Uh, or you, you pointed out two commanders. What about throughout the armed services? I would say that throughout the armed services, we've seen it receive increased emphasis as we've, as, again, as we've gone through the process. Um, is it at the level that we believe it should be? There's still room for improvement, but that is increased emphasis. Does, in does the, that indicate the that there are commanders who are not fulfilling that request? Will any of the panelists yeah. answer Mr. that? Mr. Gamble, let me just say that th this is a leadership issue we have identified and we have, uh, and frankly, this subcommittee's hearings have helped us in bringing this issue to the attention of the leadership in the Pentagon from the very top to the field commanders. It is one of those issues that you just continuously have to remind people of because, as Mr. Steensma said, the commanders are always balancing priorities. So we are very, we in the IG business, are very appreciative to this subcommittee for holding this hearing. Well, I appreciate your uh, support of our hearings, but I'm asking you a question. Are there other field commanders out there who are not abiding by the request of the department? I would best describe it, Mr. Gilman, as a sliding scale. We have identified two very stellar commanders who have taken I, our... I heard about that. What about the other commanders? There's, there are a myriad of them. There, I mean, we've, we've looked at uh, you I know, realize hundreds you've got of, many out there. Are right. they abiding by the request of the department to fulfill their preparedness in, this, uh, in the event of any chemical or biological and, attack? As we've said, many have room for improvement. So it, I mean, there there are some that have done it in better degrees than others, and we are continuously focusing the attention of the leadership of the Pentagon on this subject, and we're grateful because this hearing helps us do that. Well, that's why we're here, and that's why I'm pressing these questions upon you, so that we can find out where the f uh, lack of attention is being uh, uh, expressed. What about the uh, uh, shortages in CB defense equipment? There's a um, there's actually a good explanation for that. And what it, is that explanation? It has to do with shelf life and not wanting to have everything go on at once to to expire at once. But I'm going to defer once again to Mr. Bloomer as a technical expert. Let him explain that. Mr. To you. Bloomer, what about the uh, shortages in CB <clears throat> defense equipment? All right, if I can talk about, for example, the new overgarment, the the. Well, Jay, first answer my question. Is there a shortage of CB defense equipment at the present time? Yes, we have found some items are in shortage. What items? If I may, I'd like to answer that this afternoon. All right, but there are important items of equipment that are in shortage at the present time? There are items that are in shortage. What's being done to correct that? Services have implemented a number of programs to find, for example, additional vendors who can produce the items. Uh, we're trying to cycle the procurement of items so they don't all expire at once, so that we don't have shortages. Well, are those shortages being made up at the present time? The services are working to resolve those shortages. But there's still shortages? You, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I just would like to ask in the very back row of this room if people can hear how the questions are being answered. Okay, I'm hearing nodding of heads. Uh, Mr. Tierney, thank you for your graciousness in letting Mr. Uh, Gilman run over his 10 minutes, and you have um, thank a you, generous Mr. 10 I think minutes. we're all uh, looking to get some answers here, so I don't have any difficulty at all with the uh, time constraints on that. Mr. Schmitz, if I might, uh, during your written testimony, you indicated that you wanted to state that each of the services has a comprehensive training program that they believe, they believe, 
will prepare their personnel to survive and operate in a chemically or biologically contaminated environment. I believe, and that's you speaking, you believe that they have put in place the foundation on which programs can be built that will provide for the protection and survivability of their personnel. I'm led to believe by the phraseology there that they are not yet beyond the foundational level uh, and that there's much more work to be done in order for them to put in place uh, some system to protect the survivability of their personnel. Am I right? They're a long way between the origins of a plan and the implementation. Well, as I mentioned, some of the services are more along that, uh, that well, the track. The Marine Corps and the Air Force are further along than the uh, Army and the Navy. I believe that's According actually. to your report, am I right? Yes. This next sentence in your report. <clears throat> How much further along? Um, I'm going to defer to Dave uh, Steen's um, <laughs> They all have good programs. The uh, the Air Force and the Marine Corps, they have definitely put a lot more emphasis onto it from the leadership level all the way down. <coughs> and uh, <clears throat> we have seen greater strengths to uh, the way they've trained their people both individually and collectively, and I think uh, the General Accounting Office mentioned there is challenges doing the collective training, which is trying to see how well somebody can do their job in a chemical environment because the suits are hot, it restricts their movements and things like that. But uh, I'll conclude my answer with that, sir. Well, th does it concern you and ought to it concern us that during the recent war games, the Millennium Challenge 2002, they didn't get into the kind of uh, exercises that deal with chemical or biological uh, systems of usage. Uh, that would be of a concern. I'm not familiar with those games, sir. Well, this report, and I haven't heard it contradicted yet, that we recently had those games and that as part of them, you know, they, they withdrew from allowing the so-called enemy or the mock enemy forces from using chemical or biological uh, agents on that. I mean, should that concern us that we're not prepared to even go through the exercises in an atmosphere that will simulate one that we might find in Iraq? Uh, that would be of concern to, uh, to me, sir. I do not know why they didn't uh, use the chemical and biological or attempt to use it during the exercise to see what happened in the uh, scenarios they were running. Mr. Decker, what do you say to that? Sir, I've not evaluated the Millennium 2002 in detail, but it would seem to be, if that is in fact true, that they did not employ chemical and biological as part of that war game, consistent with the comments we heard from the field in our previous reports, that this is a very difficult issue to incorporate into your training. It's time consuming. You have to break out gear and use it, which means you may violate the integrity of the gear, putting it back into storage. This is something commanders do not typically like to do in the field. Well, can either or each of you gentlemen address the idea of how much are we lacking in training of our troops to deal with this kind of a confrontation? Where are we on that? I, I know, Mr. Schmitz, you indicated that you thought uh, they'd be there by 2005 or something on, the, on that basis. I mean, I think you know, we may be there a lot sooner than that in reality. So where are we in terms of training of our troops? I think it's fair to say that the senior most levels of the Pentagon are focusing each of the services to accelerate their, their training so that we are, uh, prepared, we are prepared and ready as best we can be earlier than, than when my office got involved. We have made recommendations that they get you know, their programs in place earlier, and we believe they're addressing and accepting our recommendations. And so my question to you is, when? Are they early enough that if this president decides to uh, unilaterally and preemptively go in uh, with the next matter of months, we're going to have all of a sudden had all the training we need from where you left off at your report to where we need to be? Right. Let me just say this. I mean, our reports are a snapshot in, in history, okay? Um, based on our reports um, and, and the work that went into our reports, I don't have any real reason to doubt what General Myers said on the 18th with the caveat that, that, that our troops are never going to be 100% protected, protected or protectable from these type of a threats. Well, how about trained? I mean, I, I'm very concerned well, that you, know, you, you yeah. left some shortages yeah. here. You indicate that they've got the foundation 
yep. on which programs can be built, but they're a long distance from actually getting it completed to the level of protection and survivability of their personnel. We've identified and then we find training. out yes. they have Millennium Challenge 2002 games recently and don't even explore that area. Let me just say this. We, we didn't look at Millennium Challenge 2002, but I know that we've had a training exercise in the Pentagon involving uh, uh, chemi chemical biological attacks, and I know that... But it brings me back to Mr. Decker's point, is that they're telling us that we're, during those training exercises, they have great difficulties doing what they want to do in training because they don't want to break the integrity of the units, which that's I understand, right. you understand. So can the two of you together, Mr. Decker, Mr. Schmitz, give us some idea of where we're at in terms of their <coughs> having some training exercises, which you label as the foundation, but they're not apparently having them to the extent that everybody that's testifying right there is comfortable because they have a lot of reservations and a lot of things that impede their actual full-blown training exercises. Mr. Decker? I would, I would say that we're better prepared today than we were in 1990-91 against a, a chemical biological attack. However, based on the, the interviews that we did with the units in the field, I am not convinced that the the realism and the the degree of of, of uh, training that has to happen at the unit level, all the way up through uh, higher echelons, takes place on a regular basis. So that if we go into war, it will be very easy to do. What about the, the requirements of the standards set by each of the military forces themselves in terms of training? Have they even met those? We reported several years ago that that was not the case. Now, uh, Mr. Decker, in your testimony, uh, both written and oral, you talked at least in passing about those 250,000 uh, suits, protective gear. Um, it's still a situation where you say we cannot locate where those 250,000 defective pieces are. Is that accurate? Well, I won't speak for the Department of Defense, but we have received no evidence that they have found clearly found and identified, located, destroyed those 250,000 suits. And so is it possible that some of them are, in fact, in line to be uh, deployed where we might need them uh, next? I think that's possible. And do we know how many of those 250,000 would be? It could be zero. It could be 250,000? Yes, sir. You, uh, you talked in your report about a process for assessing risk in the services, and you said that it was flawed. Would, would you go into that in a little bit more detail for us? Is do How are these services assessing uh, the risk that's involved in here, and why aren't we getting a clearer picture? Sir, allow me to uh, refer to a dia uh, one of the, the diagrams in the report. Our, our record for uh, statement for the record, it uh, would be page... Uh, the individual pieces of gear. Uh, page eight. Exactly. When we <coughs> identified this risk issue, um, you have to assume that when a serviceman goes into combat in a contaminated environment, he's going to need a complete ensemble to be able to be safe. In the ensemble, you're meaning the mask, mask the, 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 overgarment, trousers, gloves, and boots primarily. What we, notify, what we noticed in the D Department of Defense annual report to Congress is that they were reporting at relatively ro low risk that there were adequate supplies in the inventory of the individual items. But when we looked at those items and where they were and what services, it was clear, if you look at page 8, that some services had a huge inventory of a particular item and not of, a, of, of another item. And that if you try to do the, the ensemble issue, you start realizing that many of these areas become higher risk. So we recommend it to the Department of Defense. Really, you should go back and look at this, this uh, process, this methodology. And if you want to assess accurately what the risk is to your servicemen, meaning will every serviceman and woman have a complete set of gear you need to relook at how you calculate that. And initially, there was resistance, but after some discussions, they have accepted that methodology. And what more would have to be done to make sure that as each man or woman has the full entire ensemble, that the ensemble was, in fact, in good shape? 
Well, there's actually two issues, sir, uh, serviceability, but also size. Um, you know, you can use a garment that's one size too large, but one size too small probably is not going to work on a battlefield. And our, uh, the issue would be the inventory management systems, which is uh, hearing was before this committee in June, identified how horrific that process is, that there is not one integrated system throughout DOD to know where things are so that the right gear gets to the right people at the right time. Does not happen. So you may find in one unit all extra larges, and you may find in another unit no trousers, and you may find masks of different sizes, perhaps not readily available to fit all the members in the right size. I mean, that is an issue. Mr. Chairman, I have two more questions to follow up on this. Yes, Mr. Decker, you had a chart up there a little while earlier where you we were showing uh, the number, <coughs> the amount of gear that was coming out of service being retired. It wasn't quite being kept up to with the amount of gear that was coming online. Correct. All right. Uh, are we remedying that situation? That's one. Thank you very much. Uh, you're, you indicated what would be two times or two major theaters and one and a half major theaters. I assume that the line between four and five is where it would be for one major conflict. Am I right? Actually, the Pentagon uses a 1.5 requirement. Right, but that's at six, right? The number six on the chart? Uh, no, sir. That would be at two. Two okay. major theater wars would be at the six. That's the solid okay. dash line. At the... Uh, Four and a half would be dash dot. Right. Uh, that would be slightly more than one theater war requirement, but less than two, 1.5. And that's where the migration is, and that's based upon, I assume, some, uh, you know, derivation of a new requirement. Instead of two wars, fight one war, but then have a cushion of 0.5. What we're showing there, though, is exactly what you said, sir. The old suits are coming down quicker than the new suits are coming in. We have no information at this time that DOD is going to remedy that with increased funding and additional suit procurement so that you don't have this train wreck in the next uh, five years. Let me ask each of you gentlemen, how long, if we expedited all the training that was necessary, and put in place all of the inventory systems that were necessary and procured all of the equipment, protective gear, et cetera, that was necessary, how long would it be before we should be comfortable that our men and women sent into a conflict where biological and chemical agents were used would be reasonably safe or as safe as possible under those conditions? Would at least have the equipment they should have. Exactly. That's a good question. Um, it deserves a good answer. I'll try to give my best answer, sir. Okay. Um, I think it's fair to say that generally the units that are currently in position, the most likely ones to be sent into harm way, are the best trained and best equipped right now. And how many numbers are we talking about there? You know, we didn't look at every unit. We did a, we, you know, we did a, we, our audit method is not to look at every single unit, but we look so at the a ones snap. you looked at that are in that category are, in your estimation, ready? What percentage or what what percentage? Of well, I, I should have interrupted you. I'm sorry. I, I was trying to get to the point. Of, I'll let you finish your answer rather than, than uh, take yeah. you off track. Go ahead. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to the people that actually did the audit here. And I think the, uh, I know we answered that question specifically in the uh, classified session, sir. Um, it's general sure. enough that I would think the American public could be able to get that answer. Uh, but I would have to go back to what to Mr. Schmidt said that overseas uh, we found a great, a lot greater attention to the training, uh, the equipage of the uh, troops, and so on. And how long would it take for us to assure that? all of the men and women that might be put into a conflict of the nature that we're anticipating would be fully protected and fully trained? I don't think I could answer that, sir. That would, I would have to defer to the department because they're the ones who 
put priorities on equipping things, buying things, and training people. So I don't think I could give a specific date. But it's clear that we're not there at the moment. Is that correct? Let me answer that question. I think that's, that was the premise the of the expert no longer wants to answer Pardon? that question. We're going to go to the No, no, no. Politics. No, I'll let Mr. Seams say what he wants to say. I have no problem with that. I don't but, mean to be a wise guy with it. I'm just I'm But I think the curious premise, to hear his answer, too. That was exactly the premise of your question is we're not currently ready. Well, are we currently ready? I guess it's the premise well, of the question. No. In your estimation, Mr. Schmitz. <laughs> We're never going to be perfectly ready, okay? I understand that. I'm and I understand. To the I think you understand my question, Mr. Yeah. Schmitz, is are we ready? And I mean, understanding we'll never be perfectly ready. You can't be in any combat situation. Could we be more ready now? Yes. Okay. And but how long, a, and do you have an estimate of how long it would take to be ready to the degree that you would feel comfortable? You know, there is an old military adage that if you wait for the perfect war, you will lose every battle. And I'm not talking about waiting for the perfect war. I'm now asking you, and I'm trying to be reasonable, because I don't think anybody expects any war to be perfect. In fact, one of the yeah. problems is we know it isn't going to be. Right. And we know there's going to be all sorts of unforeseen right. consequences. But the ones that we can foresee, such as the potential use of chemical or biological agents against our men and women, right. are they trained sufficiently and are they ready in terms of preparedness of whatever protective gear they might have at this moment or should we have it in better shape? But, but you're asking, with all respect, an operational question to an independent office that does audits and investigations. Okay. And that question is better addressed to the operational commanders. Okay. I mean, it, because it essentially involves an operational weighing of, of, of risks, risks against... Yes, sir. All right. I accept that. I sir. wanted to ask it. Mr. Uh, Steesman? Yes, sir. Do you want to answer that to any more specificity? Uh, no, I wouldn't, sir. Mr. Decker? Mr. Attorney, I'm unable to, to quantify exactly uh, when we would be ready, but in closed session, I will we'll discuss two specific issues that shade my optimism. That, do what? Shape it or shade it? Shade. S-H-A-D? Shade? Yes, sir. Shade my optimism. Shade your opposition. Thank you, and thank you for your uh, courtesy. Let me extend questions. Um, Ms. Watson? You have the floor for 10 minutes plus. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to submit my opening statement for the record. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think we probably have the wrong panel here. We have their testimony in writing. I've gone through uh, their written testimony. To the extent that it's accurate, I think that uh, our questions are answered, and I'll just repeat very quickly some of the statements that caught my eye. We have continuing concerns in each of these areas. And uh, the supply of chemical protective clothing and the way it is associated is assessed. We believe that the risk of protective clothing shortages may increase dramatically from now through at least 2007. Serious problems still persist. And um, we concluded that chemical and biological defense equipment training and medical problems were persisting and if not addressed were likely to result in needless casualties and a degradation of U.S. war fighting capabilities. Um, the medical readiness of some units to conduct operations in a contaminated environment therefore remain questionable, and military service members may not be able to avoid exposure to chemical and biological agents and has consequently provided U.S. forces with individual protective equipment, and they go on to include, <laughs> but the bottom line is there are many needed improvements that still remain to be realized. The service members of our country may be at risk in a contaminated environment. These are your reports, and I'm just repeating for uh, the public what you have said in conclusion. I would think, Mr. Chair, that we need to have the operational managers in here and find out what's really going on. I appreciate the testimony from these gentlemen, but I find uh, the way they're answering these questions non-conclusive, and maybe they don't have the information we need. So I would suggest that we dispense 
with this hearing and wait to get into the classified hearing so that when I go back to my constituents, I can give them the truth. What is very, very bothersome to me is that we're rushing every single day. We hear the administration saying we need to rush into an attack on Iraq. For we know Saddam Hussein has biological weapons that he is not afraid to use and has used them. Are we exposing our men and women at this point to contamination and subsequently their children, knowingly that we cannot protect them? Now, don't come back at me with perfection. I'm not asking about perfection. I'm asking about some risk assessment, and are we ready? Apparently, you gentlemen cannot answer that question for me exactly. So my suggestion would be, let's not waste any more time. Let's get operational managers here, and let's go into the classified session. And I will take back the truth to my people. I am not going to support going blindly into warfare in an environment that can cause great bodily harm and our death, not only to this generation, but to uh, subsequent generations. And I don't need an answer. It's just a statement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I appreciate the uh, gentlelady's comments. I, I think that you all, both, uh, both uh, uh, the GAO and Inspector Generals, are providing a a tremendous um, opportunity for us to know at least what we can state on the public record and then the questions that we need to ask uh, behind closed doors. I, um, we would uh, not even be uh, anywhere along as well as we are with the issue of protective gear had it not been for the work of your predecessors in the Inspector General's <laughs> Office and the GAO. Uh, and I give you an example uh, before I get into questions. but. When I did, uh, when I met with the British and the French and the Israelis uh, to t discuss protective gear in the early 90s, <clears throat> they didn't want American equipment. They wanted their own or they wanted in other countries. Uh, when, when I speak with them today, uh, <clears throat> they want our equipment. So we know we have good equipment. We know, uh, uh, we certainly know it's better than what other countries have. And, and I say that with no reluctance. And I think that is in part the work that this committee and you all have done to just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. But I also um, feel that both of you have, uh, both the GAO and Inspector General, have put on the record some, some um, very um, important information that says uh, we may be ready in certain instances and we may not be ready in, in other instances. I can't imagine, for instance, that we would be able to mass 700,000 troops uh, and think that they would be protected. It tells me that given the, the type of uh, warfare that we may encounter, which would be potentially chemical or biological, that uh, it's going to have to be uh, a different strategy, in part because of the limitations that we have um, with our equipment, but also in part because uh, we're not going to give Saddam Hussein such a large and, uh, and uh, tempting target. Uh, but obviously, we will also have some dialogue with our second panel in open um, forum. Let me um, ask either of uh, anyone in the panel first to uh, be willing to give me a little bit of an education as you would define readiness versus risk. I understand from the GAO that your primary focus would be on risk. Is that correct, Mr. Decker? When you, when your contribution to this panel. Yes, sir. I okay. think in past reports and, we. And, and when we look at risk, we're looking at availability, suitability, and durability, correct? Those would be some of the factors if you talk about gear. And one of the contributions that you're making is that when we look at whether there's a high risk or low risk, when we just take a certain part of the equipment and isolate it and not put it as part of the package, that we get a distorted view. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, but what I'm also understanding is it's not like we add it all together and we put it in one chain and we say whatever's the weakest link 
is potentially the great, uh, if something is a high risk, then everything is a high, let me just say a risk, not a high risk. Uh, it's possible you could put together one part that is a moderate risk and another part that is a risk, and they can add up to be high risk collectively? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you talk about a mask and outer garment, boots and gloves, if you had no gloves, you would be at high risk even though you have four out of the five components. Right. So one, all the other ones could be adequately supplied, but if you didn't have gloves, you're still at risk and I'm high getting, risk. I'm getting at something a little more subtle, though. Um, that, to me, is putting it all in a row and saying you got a weak link, you don't have the gloves, so, you know, the rest is meaningless. But it's my understanding that, that in a sense, it's almost like four chains down, and maybe uh, if, you, if one is pretty vulnerable, the other three chains can pull you up but that if the other one has a, has a moderate uh, risk or even is uh, a moderate risk, the two together uh, can add up to be something than the, gr the greater of either one of them individually. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I, um, the, and so your testimony before this committee is that the Department of Defense has accepted making sure we look at the full package as a risk and not isolating. And so that's good news. But when was that decided? Since the report in September. Sir, since the report that was released in September. So this is a new process. So we have to go back to the drawing board, correct? Correct. And we have to look at risk uh, again as now under the the definition and the process that you've defined, correct? Yes, sir. Do we have a sense when that's going to be done? So I think the next panel will be able to address that. Okay. Uh, okay. We'll make sure we ask the next panel. In terms of readiness, someone speak to the concept of readiness. Um, I happen to think that if you've got risks, you're not ready, and so I'm mixing the two, and you need to give me a little bit of a, a lesson here. Who wants to do it? I'm going to have you put the mic nice and close. Yes, sir. Now, is the smile of frustration that I may not get it, or it's, is it uh, that you're not sure you'll be able to explain it? All attempt. Okay. <laughs> uh, if you would put the mic a little closer. I, this, is, this is my understanding of trying. I am just trying to appreciate the concept of readiness. And um, if you need a little more time to think of your answer, let me just go to another question, okay? But before I leave this panel, I want you all to define the concept of readiness to me. I'm sure the military will, but I'd like to have some confidence that you can define it. Uh, are you, do you want to answer the question? Yeah, okay. Yeah. I would say that in attempting to define readiness, it would, it would go to the core of is the unit or force able to conduct its mission as it was intended and planned to be done? Uh, is it in alignment with with how they envision executing their plan? Okay. Now, a lot of factors go into that. Do you have enough people of the right skill, and are they trained to the right as level? We, as it relates to the whole issue of chemical and biological. Another warfare. element would, that would go into it is equipment level. Do you have sufficient <laughs> quantities of equipment to conduct your mission in any kind of environment, be it chemical or biological or or a pristine environment. And it, and it would go to the issue, for instance, if you're, if you're properly trained and so on. Yes. Now, I felt that, that the Inspector General was speaking more to the issue of readiness as opposed to the issue of risk. Uh, in other words, you could, have, you could have all your equipment perform well. Um, uh, it, it's available. It's, 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 the suitability is fine. The durability is good. But if you don't have enough of it, you're not ready, correct? I would agree, yes. If you haven't been properly trained, you're not ready, correct? Or as ready as you could be. Right. Um, if you don't know how to put it on, uh, the equipment that may work very well if properly <laughs> put on is, 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 is not going to work, so you are therefore not ready, correct? Correct. Okay. If um, when we look at chemical uh, biological defense, we want to look at contamination avoidance. In other words, if we don't have to go into the area, uh, we want to be able to, to uh, so we have to be able, we, we might want to avoid it, 
we need to detect it, we need to d identify it, and we need to locate it, correct? Correct. I'm sorry? Correct. Yeah. If we, if, in terms of protection, we are concerned about protecting not just the individual, but maybe a facility like a hospital. Um, and so there's more than just chemical protection dealing with a mask and a suit, but also uh, to make sure that we can secure an area so, for instance, nurses and doctors can work without having to wear masks. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And, and um, in, in, in a decontamination setting, we need to be able to, to, to decontaminate equipment that has been exposed to chemicals or biological agents, and, and in some cases the people have, have been exposed as well. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So these are very, these are a lot of, uh, a lot of significant uh, effort here. In other words, if you don't have the detection equipment, y you may have to force yourself to wear equipment that will inhibit your mission, and it would be a lot easier to know if you could detect it before you had to put it on. Is that correct? Yes, it would be. Okay. Let me um, let me just. Uh, go to um, in the um, the DOD basically the IG has talked about the defense uh, uh, logistic agency and um, you believe that 250,000 unaccounted uh, 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 suits that are not properly, uh, are not, are, are defective, uh, were issued, worn, and disposed of, correct? Yes, sir. Now, and the question is, what is the task required to know uh, where, in other words, we ha right now it seems to me we have to assume that the 250, in other words, we're being asked to assume that the 250 is no longer in the system, that if it was, we used it for training and we've disposed of it. Tell me how we can get an answer to that question. And if we can't get an answer to the question, do we have to make the assumption that somewhere between zero and 250 suits are out on the loose and that it's kind of like what I would call Russian roulette. You've got one, uh, one, uh, um, bullet in the barrel and uh, you know you just have to hope that that when you pull the trigger that bullet isn't the the one uh, that the bullet isn't in the chamber when you pull the trigger is it that kind of problem or is there a logical way to get at and be assured that there is no defective equipment in the system well let me just say this this is a, a an age-old problem and inspectors generals have been looking at this problem since the Revolutionary War um, and, you know, and, they haven't and, solved it. And, well, and let me just say to you something. Some have been more successful than others, no, let me no, say. And, I, and, and the blame is not on the Inspector General and the GAO. Yeah. The issue is we have known for decades that even during World War I, the Millet Department, DOD, had the opportunity to grow and to learn from its chemical, chemological, uh, its biological potential and, and chemical warfare um, uh, uh, opportunities and and have not learned much reports that were done uh, we can't find so I mean we we can go on and on the fact that you're telling me this has been an age-old problem um, is is significant in one sense but meaningless in another because we are in the day and age when chemical and biological weapons will be used so there can be no excuse and what I'm asking is You've heard the other members ask the question about the 250,000 uh, defective equipment. We can make an assumption that some are not in the system, but we can't make the assumption that all aren't in the system. Is that correct? That's right. These are uh, unaccounted for. Okay. And, and so we're being asked on good faith and on some logic that some of it would have been used. The question I'm asking is, in a sense, are we asking we, can we identify all 250,000 of them? I think the answer is no. no. Is there a, now the next question is, is there a way to identify them? And jail, Mr. Decker, is there a way to identify? What will it take to identify them? Yes, sir, based on our experience of trying to do an inventory review 
of protective equipment. We actually got into boxes to look at contract numbers, lot numbers, because there was no system device, nothing in the inventory management system that would provide us that accurate information. And nowhere in the system that would say exactly where these things were located. Okay, we don't know where they're located, but if, if we locate them, can we identify them as bad? Once you have a contract number and a lot number, and if it's identified as defective. So can I, and I, I appreciate my colleagues, let me, so if we don't do that, is it not a fact that we are then telling some members of our military force that they may have the shell in the chamber? Sorry. The military forces have attempted to locate these suits uh, in, by a variety of means. Okay, I'm going uh, to have you tell me that. But I'm just saying right now, if we haven't identified them and we don't seem to be having a program to identify every one of them, isn't it a fact that in essence some members of the military will be issued faulty equipment? It is a possibility, it's not a certainty, because we don't know whether some of those suits may have been used, for example, in training, and that there's no means to account for which ones were used in that fashion. Okay, but now the IG's testimony was, as recently as April 2002, we continued to identify units that had not segregated these, those defective garments in their inventories. The bottom line to my question, I'm going to end with this. Is there a way, I'm not saying it won't be expensive, I'm not saying it won't require a lot of work, but is there a way to identify every faulty piece of equipment that was part of that particular manufacturer's uh, product? Sir, not without a lot of labor. But with labor, it would be possible. Obviously, if you cited each suit, which would be extremely labor intensive, you could probably get to the bottom line. Okay. Does anyone from the Inspector General disagree with that answer? No, we agree with that. It would be labor intensive because they would have to open numerous boxes, go through them with the lot numbers and identify them and pull them out. And but numerous boxes would be? I don't know how many hundreds and thousands are out millions there. Millions of boxes. Um, I don't know if it's millions. Well, so then the end result is that we are going to be asking some members of the military, unless they are issued totally new equipment, who go into uh, Iraq, if that happens, we're going to be asked, asking them to take a chance that, that, you know, one chamber has a bullet. And then when they pull the trigger, it, you know, they, they, they're the, they pay the negative result. So it, I guess, I guess, um, let me go Chair, to, I, yeah. Just to follow up yeah. on that, I mean, I, I sense that we're going to be told in the next panel that not to worry about this, that uh, they've accounted for all the suits because they've had training and they've worn them and everything like that. Is that even remotely possible that that's the case? Sir, I think it's possible, but I would ask for the evidence. Not verifiable. Sir. Thank you. May, may I follow up? Sure, you? sure. I had uh, written a question to Mr. Kucinich to that I'll ask now. Uh, I'm listening very carefully to you, gentlemen. I appreciate you trying to give us frank answers. Uh, what I'm summarizing this to believe is that, no, we do not have protection for every single service personnel that would be required to go into an area that could be potentially deadly for them. Uh, as in the Vietnam War and the Gulf War, many of our military personnel came back and uh, stated that they had health conditions that were strange and alien to them. Uh, are you gentlemen recommending that as a result of going into Iraq that our veterans then be given full benefits and, and care for whatever might happen to them as a result of biological and chemical warfare? Would that be a recommendation from you or would that be a recommendation from the, uh, I guess, operational managers, or who would be recommending? Because it seemed like there was some denial that Agent Orange had an effect on the veterans of Vietnam. And it seems that veterans have struggled for decades All to right. get some recognition of the problems they face because of chemical and biological I think uh, it's a, ver a very important question, Ms. Watson. Um, who should I ask? 
I think you should ask the Secretary of Veterans Affairs and the Secretary of Defense, uh, and hopefully our audits and our reports will be useful in them Thank reaching you. that decision. I appreciate that because I'm trying to get to the right personnel to answer the questions. And listening to all of you, <laughs> you have prepared these reports, but you can't give us the details because apparently it's classified. So in trying to get to the truth and have some accuracy, I appreciate your response. Thank you. Let me, uh, Mr. Gilman. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. We'll try to get to the next panel. I, I'm concerned. You're telling us that the defective equipment has not been located, but through additional manpower, we may be able to elect, uh, be able to detect where that defective <clears throat> equipment is. If that's possible, then, what are we doing to undertake that kind of a procedure? I think you need to ask the uh, next panel and the Defense Logistics Agency and the services what they're going to do. I know after the last hearing, uh, they put out several messages. They've tried to identify these uh, in the past. The problem we run into when we're in the field is the word doesn't always get down to each individual unit, which could be in the United States or overseas here, and uh, it would take a coordinated program by the uh, department's logistics people to try to go out and identify and make sure all of them are pulled. Well, Mr. Steesma, why have some units not received the advisories regarding these defective pieces of equipment? Don, you would. Mr. Bloomer. I guess the, the easiest way to explain it would be that not every unit has a person as part of the unit who is designated as a chemical and biological professional. But wouldn't that be the responsibility of the commander of the it, unit? It would be, but a lot of the service notices and recall notices that come down come down through the chemical and biological community, and it, it filters down that way or it filters down through supply channels. They don't always send them to the commanders of the unit. So what you're telling us, Mr. Bloomer, is that there may be some commanders or some units that have not received advisories about this defective equipment. Is that correct? Yes. And, uh, Mr. Schmitz, uh, one of you on the panel has said if we utilize more manpower, we can find out where the defective equipment is. Am I correct? Mr. Steensma said that. I agree. And is that being employed, that method? Uh, not at this time. You would have to ask the next panel because they're the ones who have the resources that they could devote to uh, an enterprise such as this. So the defective equipment can be detected by utilizing more manpower in order to make certain that our troops, when they go out on a battlefield, are not going to use defective equipment. Am I correct? I would have to agree with that, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kucinich, do you have more questions? To uh, Mr. Decker, the uh, Defense Logistics Agency has said that uh, they believe that 250,000 unaccounted for overgarments that were um, uh, that were issued that are in question here, the ones that are defective, that they uh, were worn and disposed of. Now. Um, How, how is it that uh, they were able to come to this conclusion? And is this conclusion supported by the facts? Sir, again, I think uh, uh, Mr. Parker from DLA will be able to address that more precisely. But if you recall, back in May of 2000... Well, I, I just want to ask you, is that, re is that conclusion supported by the facts? They're, they're asserting that all defective protective suits have been disposed of. 
Is that statement supported by the facts? Sir, we have not seen evidence that the 250,000 defective suits have been found and disposed of properly. Okay, that, I just wanted to make sure that that was on, on the record. Now, um, the Defense Department has agreed that they understated the risk relating to all of the components of the protective suits. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, and this is why they agreed to go back and change the way they examine these questions. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Now, my question is this. Does the Defense Department also agree with your conclusion on page 8 and 9 of your report that, in fact, service members are at high risk, not low risk? That was page 8 and 9 of the report. Does the Defense Department also agree with your conclusion that, in fact, service members are at high risk, not low risk? Sir, that was our conclusion. Uh, we have not received specific response on that particular point uh, as to whether they agree with that. I think uh, that question would be better deferred to them. Uh, however, uh, they did agree that the method of calculating the risk uh, would be better uh, done if it were done by the entire ensemble rather than the individual pieces. Uh, by the entire ensemble. Now, uh, you know, I quoted General Myers at the beginning of this hearing who said the military is prepared based on, on what you know, Mr. Decker, on what you provided to this committee. Uh, do you agree with that statement? Uh, General Myers' statement, sir? Right. Do you think there's concerns that ought to be? Sir, based on the, the work that we've done, the reports over the last couple of years about this issue of, of individual protective equipment and the deficiencies, the problems, locations, and issues, I would have reservation that everything is exactly the way it should be uh, for any future conflict. Well, has the military met the basic minimum requirements? Can the military fail to meet the basic military requirements and still protect the troops? Sir, going back to my uh, chart, you can see where there are some serious dips below what the requirement is and what we have on hand today. And if they don't, if they don't meet the basic minimum requirements, um, how are our troops protected at all? Are they? Well, the individual protective equipment, as I indicated, is your last line of fence. And if each serviceman and woman that is in a, in a contaminated environment does not have the proper serviceable gear, then they are at risk. Uh, you, you have in your testimony here that uh, you, you mentioned the individual pieces, the suits, the masks, the breathing filters, gloves, boots, and hoods, uh, and that there's questions about the supply, the inventory, um, could even be questions about safety in the case of suits. And then when you look at the ensemble, you get into the possibility that, you know, this may not all come together. I mean, and here's what I was thinking. Um, for the moment, let's, let's not talk about what's a very grim matter here, our preparation of our servicemen and women for, for battle. Let's say we were talking for a moment about a professional football team that was getting ready for the Super Bowl. And let's say that the uniforms provided for this team to protect them when they're on the field of play, let's say players had wrong sizes. Some had knee pads, some didn't. Some had shoulder pads, some didn't. Some had hip pads, some didn't. Some had shoes with cleats, some didn't. Some had helmets, and some didn't. Or some had helmets that were the wrong size. Now, the team really wouldn't be ready to play. People would be asking, well, how could you? You're a Super Bowl team. How in the world could you be in a condition where you don't have the right equipment and you're not ready. How could that be? Well, let's say, you know, we have the best military in the world. Are they ready to play in the Super Bowl in the Persian Gulf? 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anyone else before we go to the next panel? I'm Mr. Decker, and let me just say this. Um, I want any of you to speak out on anything that you think the record is not clear on or any question you wished we had asked that we didn't ask. I want it on the record. So if there's anything you want to put on the record, please do it. If there's any, any uh, need to clarify the record, let's do it and do it now, okay? Mr. Decker, do you have some? Yes, Chairman Shays. Um, I wanted to, uh, to, to mention that the GAO does not have classification authority that that is received by the executive branch agencies that review our work. And I have to note that in the area of chem biodefense and force protection, we are experiencing lengthy classification reviews by the Department of Defense. And in many cases, our final draft products, which we send to the department for comment, using unclassified material and sources are becoming classified. Like the DODIG, I believe it is critical that we protect our products and, and prevent exposure of vulnerabilities. And there's a way that that can be done, which is called sanitization, meaning taking specific details out. However, we're experiencing, in some cases, up to two months a delay in issuing a report while it goes through this very uh, uncertain classification review process. And I would like to see the Department of Defense uh, address that issue to be able to provide a speedy classification review so that we can provide the information that the Congress needs. Thank you. Sir. Uh, any other comment from our panel? I would like to put one comment on, on, on the table here. And this was when we had a hearing on June 19th, um, excuse me, we had a hearing in April 1997. We had Air Force Major Michael Donnelly testify before our committee. He suffered from the progressive debilitating effects of ALS, or what we call Lou Kerrick's disease. M Major Donnelly recounted a now all too familiar litany of official refusals to connect his illness with his military service. He was a once robust fighter pilot sat before us in a wheelchair, his body racked by the effects of the disease, but he spoke with arching eloquence from a heart undamaged by his plight declaring, I am not the enemy. This veteran of 44 combat missions in the Gulf War described the shock and disappointment of having to confront a fatal disease and his own government's cold incuriosity about the cause of his illness. Now, he believed ALS was triggered or accelerated by wartime explosions, in, in, including organic phosphate pesticides. And for many years, that possibility was dismissed or ignored. Uh, recently. Uh, the Department of Defense and Veterans Affairs has uh, acknowledged that, uh, that he, in fact, uh, may have suffered uh, this illness because of his duty in service. But this is the key point. When asked if he would go to war again knowing what would befall him, Michael Donnelly did not hesitate one second before saying yes. And so I want it on the record. I believe that most uh, men and women in the force even if they knew about their vulnerabilities, would still choose to serve our country and engage whatever enemy in battle. Uh, we just like to make sure that, one, uh, first, that, they, that it's never a fair fight, that they always have the advantage, and two, that they never have any illusions about uh, what can defend them or not. And uh, Mr. Donnelly, I think, stands uh, as a memorable moment for this committee. I am prepared to go on the next panel unless anyone else like to. Okay. Uh, I thank you. Uh, I thank sincerely the work of the IG and all your people, the work of the uh, Inspector General uh, uh, and GAO. It's, um, you do a wonderful service for the men and women in uniform and uh, to the eventual success of whatever undertaking we uh, choose to, to make. So um, thank you very much, and we'll get to our next panel. Thank you. I appreciate the, uh, this panel, too, its patience and its listening to uh, panel one. Uh, we have Dr. Anna Johnson Weingard, assist Wingard, Winnegar, I'm sorry. <coughs> I keep saying it wrong. I do know her and respect her. Winnegar, Dr. Anna Johnson Winnegar, assistant 
to Secretary of Defense for CVD, Department of Defense, General uh, Stephen Goldfein, Deputy Director, Joint Warfare Capability Analysis, JCS, Department of Defense, Major General William L. Bond, Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Army, uh, Department of Defense, Mr. Michael A. Parker, Deputy to the Commander, U.S. Army Soldier and Biological Chemical Command, and Mr. George Allen, Deputy Director, Defense Supply Center, Philadelphia, Defense Logistic Agency, Department of Defense. If they would come, we will swear you in, and uh, so you might want to stay standing. <coughs> Sorry, it's such a cramped table there. If you'd raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm? Excuse me, I'm sorry. If you put your hand down, is there anyone else who may testify as well that might assist you? If there's a possibility, I'd just as soon not have to swear them in. So if you think that anyone else may want to or may need it, to, would you ask them to stand? Is there anyone? Okay, seeing none, if you just raise your hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. <laughs> note for the record, our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. I would also like to note for the record that all of you are accomplished uh, people in your field of work. You have served, you are serving our country well, you have served our country well, and uh, we consider it an honor to have you before the committee. Uh, we obviously have some questions that we'd like to ask you, and. I think you know in the spirit in which we ask those questions. So we're going to uh, go to the five minute. If you make your statement, uh, uh, Dr. Winnegar, I apologize for not saying your name correctly. Um, thank you for your patience in that regard. We'll go with Dr. Winnegar, uh, General uh, Goldfein, uh, General Bond, uh, Mr. Parker, and then Mr. Allen. We'll go in that order, okay? And we have a five minute and we trip over. I would prefer that you didn't take the full 10 minutes, but uh, whatever you think you need to. Thank you. Chairman and distinguished committee members, I'm honored to appear before you again to address some of your concerns about the department's chemical and biological defense program. <coughs> I'm Anna Johnson Winnegar, <coughs> and I serve as the deputy assistant to the secretary of defense for chemical and biological defense. I'd like to focus my remarks today on improvements to the management and oversight process for the Department's Chemical and Biological Defense Program. As a result of several initiatives <coughs> subsequent to my last testimony, the Department has made progress in improving areas that are of interest to your subcommittee, and we will continue to see improvements as recent decisions are implemented over the next few months. Along with me today are other representatives from DOD who will speak to their particular area of expertise. In order to address some of the problems related to the acquisition of chemical and biological defense systems identified during Operation Desert Storm, the Department's Chemical and Biological Defense Program was established in 1994. This law mandates, as you know, the coordination and integration of all Department of Defense chemical and biological programs under the oversight of a single office. Under this program, the individual services submit their budget requests under one defense-wide account separate from their service accounts. In addition, we submit an annual report to the Congress concerning all aspects of the chemical and biological defense program. Following the defense reform initiative in 1997, the position of assistant to the Secretary of Defense for nuclear chemical and biological defense was left vacant, and my office was placed under the Director of Defense Research and Engineering. In November of 2001, the Senate confirmed Dr. Dale Klein to fill the position of ATSD NCB, and subsequently my office was moved from DDR&E and now reports to Dr. Klein. This reorganization, I believe, has increased the priority and emphasis of ChemBio Defense within the department. This increased attention also led to the increase in the size of my office staff from only two to now nine permanent positions plus additional supporting resources. To ensure a focused effort in the area of homeland defense, 
The Deputy Secretary of Defense directed the establishment of a consequence management program integration office and directed that the functions previously performed by that office be institutionalized throughout the department. And in February of 2001, <coughs> they further directed that research, development, and acquisition of that equipment be responsible, be the responsibility be delegated to my office. As a result of that, funding to complete the modernization of the weapons of mass destruction civil support teams is now part of the Chem Bio Defense Program. Also, due to the increased visibility and importance of chemical biological defense within the department, the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, Mr. Pete Aldrich, in May of 2001, implemented increased departmental oversight of this program by formally designated, designating the Chem Bio Defense Program as an Acquisition Category 1D program. This designation raises the priority and visibility of the Chem Bio Defense Program within the department and identifies the program as a major defense acquisition program. This landmark decision provides oversight by senior department officials over this critical national asset. Other recent changes have significantly affected the security environment and the requirements of the Chem Bio Defense Program. As mentioned earlier today, the QDR of September 2001 changed the basic force structure to support major theater wars, giving greater emphasis on smaller regional conflicts. The services are evaluating the impact of this changed force structure on system requirements. Secondly, the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001 and the subsequent anthrax letter attacks have increased the potential roles and missions for the Department of Defense in supporting Homeland Security. Funding for defense against the potentially devastating threat of chemical and biological attacks post-September 11th was added from the Defense Emergency Response Fund and Title IX of the Defense Appropriations Act of 2002, which has allowed the DOD to procure critical defense capabilities and to energize the research base to address the most critical deficiencies in this key area. Another management change recently approved by the Joint Requirements Oversight Council is the creation of a Joint Requirements Office for Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear Defense. General Goldfein will address more details regarding that. Another key issue, another key management change is the very recent approval of a Joint Program Executive Office for Chemical, Biological Defense in a memorandum signed by Mr. Aldrich on 19th September. The criticality and importance of an integrated and viable program to the nation has increased significantly, and the visibility of chemical and biological defense within all government agencies has increased far beyond the scope <coughs> of the program originally established in 1994. The program must be visionary, able to respond quickly to warfighter and national security needs, and be streamlined with authority and accountability. The JPEO will supersede the existing management structure. The JPEO will report through the Army Acquisition Executive to the Defense Acquisition Executive. Mr. Aldridge will continue to serve as the single milestone decision authority for the Chem Bio Defense Program. This streamlines the acquisition process, and in support of the USD ATNL's responsibilities, Dr. Dale Klein will establish and chair a permanent overarching integrated product team consisting of representatives from the military services, the Joint Staff, and the Office of Secretary of Defense. The Army will continue to serve as the executive agent for the Joint Service Chem Bio Defense Program. Major General Bond and Mr. Parker will detail key aspects of the acquisition program with emphasis on individual protective equipment. Consumable NBC defense items and maintenance of fielded items are managed by the services and the Defense Logistics Agency in accordance with their Title X responsibilities. Information on the logistical status of the service's chemical and biological defense equipment is included in our annual report to the Congress. The most recent annual report implemented GAO recommendations to list items on contract separately from those who are actually on hand. Well, that's going to be 
We feel this gives a more accurate picture of the logistics readiness for U.S. forces. However, the annual report only provides a snapshot in time of the overall readiness of U.S. forces. Mr. George Allen from DLA will address more issues related to logistics and inventory management. In conclusion, as I have outlined, I feel there have been significant changes in the management and oversight structures of the chemical and biological defense program over the past two years. Do I believe everything is perfect? Of course not. But do I believe everything is better than it was? Absolutely yes. The Department has made significant improvements from the decade since Desert Storm. We have made improvements over the past two years alone to improve the priority and importance of protecting our service members against chemical and biological threats. These changes have streamlined the oversight process and improved joint service coordination. They will also enhance the linkage between requirements and fielded capabilities. These changes are still in the process of being implemented and will continue to yield improvements. I want to assure this subcommittee that the Department views chemical biological defense as one of our highest priorities, and we remain committed to continued efforts to improve our program to assure the best possible defense for our men and women who will face the threat posed by chemical and biological agents. Thank you. Uh, General Goldfein. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Kucinich, members of the committee, approximately two months ago, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff established a Joint Requirements Office for chemo Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear Defense within the J-8 Directorate of the Joint Staff. The Chairman's guidance included a specific charter, a manning document, and an implementation plan for this Joint Requirements Office. I am assigned the additional duty to serve as the Director of the JROO. Coincidentally, today is our first official day as an organization. The remainder of my statement describes our organizational vision and objectives as we look forward, which I request be inserted into the record, and I thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General. General Bond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee, for this opportunity to discuss uh, the chemical and biological defense program. Um, I am the Deputy for Systems Management and Horizontal Technical Integration, reporting through the Acqu Army Acquisition Executive to the Secretary of the Army. And as you have requested, I would like to describe at the macro level the processes we use in the defense acquisition system to take a requirement or a technology and turn it into a tangible, reliable, and sustainable product that supports the warfighter. I am here today representing the Honorable Claude Bolton, Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology, and the Army Acquisition Executive. I respectfully request that his written statement be made part of the record for today's hearing. Before I get into the details, let me put Mr. Bolton's and my bottom line up front. The Army's intent is to make sure our fighting men and women have the world's best chemical, biological defense. Mr. Chairman, you and your committee and other members of Congress have expressed concern over our chemical and biological defense capabilities. You have challenged us to move out with all dispatch to attain the needed capabilities, and we have accepted that challenge. I spent over 32 years in military services, fighting the war fighting units and in staff positions. My tours in fighting forces in Germany, Korea, and here in the United States taught me firsthand that when our military is in harm's way, our soldiers, airmen, sailors, and Marines need and deserve the very best we can provide them. It is my earnest hope that chemical and biological weapons will never be used. However, history dampens that hope. Therefore, we are attacking the task of developing and fielding needed chemical, biological defense capabilities <laughs> with a sense of urgency and a determination to overcome any bureaucratic obstacles that may remain. The very lives of our fighting forces and our fellow citizens are at stake. And with that in mind, I will do all I can to make sure we are ready to meet our chemical and biological threats we may encounter in the modern battlefield. To begin, I need to describe the roles of three key people in the acquisition process. The first is the Milestone Decision Authority, or MDA. The MDA is often the defense or the Army acquisition executive, depending on the dollar value of the program. This is the person responsible for the decisions allowing a program to enter or proceed into the next life cycle phase. The next person with a critical role in the process is the Program Executive Officer, or PEO. 
The PEO for Chemical and Biological Defense executes jointly the life cycle research, development, procurement, and deployment of major end items of chemical and biological defense equipment. <coughs> the mission is accomplished by maintaining continuous and effective communication with our warfighters. Each of the military services, the research, development, test and evaluation community, the Office of Secretary of Defense, and of course Congress who have oversight responsibility are involved. The third key person is the program or project manager. The PM is responsible for the day-to-day -day activities of the program and directs the concepts, designs, development, production, and initial deployment of our defense systems within the approved limits of cost, schedule, and performance. The PM ensures the warfighter requirements are met efficiently and effectively in the shortest possible time. As a result of our OSD-led review of the Chemical Biological Defense Program Management, the Defense Acquisition Executive directed implementation of a revives management concept that will effectively use all three individuals discussed above. The Army is in the process of working with DOD components on the details of this implementation. But as our intent is to structure a management organization that works, I have pledged to the DAE that we will assist in developing a management plan that will clearly define the roles and responsibility of all involved. In addition, we will assist in developing organizational metrics, which are few in number, simple to understand, <coughs> and reportable to the DAE on a regular basis. These metrics will show the effectiveness and efficiency of the organization and provide real data upon which to recognize and make organizational adjustments in the future, if needed. With the organizational concept in place, let me briefly discuss some of the responsibilities and processes we will use to get the products to the warfighter. Each of the Pacific Commodity Areas has a corresponding Program Management Office, or PMO, and respective programs fall under their area of responsibility. The PEO and the PM use the Defense Acquisition System on a daily basis to execute their responsibilities. The principles that govern this process encourage innovation, flexibility, tailoring, continuous improvement of the acquisition system itself. This process is intended to provide effective product transition from science and technology through development and production to fielding and sustainment. Validated, time-phased requirements allow for an evolutionary program acquisition. Advanced technologies are integrated into producible systems and deployed in the shortest possible time. The DOD acquisition management framework is shown on the right here, and you each should have a copy here, which was distributed earlier. As requested by the subcommittee, I will now walk through you with the defense acquisition life cycle. The cycle is a continuum of phases. The phases are pre-system acquisition, system acquisition, and sustainment. The MDA can allow a program to enter an acquisition life cycle at any phase in accordance with the technical maturity and acceptable risk. The program life cycle starts with a validated user need statement or operational requirements documents or a mission need statement. The requirements generation process manages the generation and validity validation of this need based on the capabilities required and in some cases a specific threat to be countered. Concurrently, as part of the pre-system acquisition phase, the PM begins identifying promising technologies in the department's laboratories, research centers, as well as in academia and from commercial sources. Entrance into the system acquisition phase indicates that the user and the developer have agreed on a design concept and a technical approach and the MDA has approved the acquisition approach. During this phase, the PM reduces the program risk and ensures the program is mature enough for production. The PM evaluates and, if necessary, reduces integration and manufacturing risk, designs for producibility, and ensures operational supportability, affordability, and interoperability. The system also undergoes rigorous testing and evaluation during this phase. The final phase is the sustainment phase, which begins when the support performance requirements are achieved and the system is sustainable in the most cost-effective manner for its entire life cycle. At this point, management of the system transitions to the Service System Command or the Defense Logistics Agency. But the program doesn't start there. At the end of its useful life, the PM ensures that the system is demilitarized and disposed of in accordance with legal and regulatory requirements. The acquisition cycle is continuous as the field identifies improvements or modifications, or as new requirements are identified by the user through evolving concept of operation or emerging doctrine, or as advances of technology surface and changes in the threat developed, we are able to insert the required material improvements and manage them in appropriate portion of the acquisition life cycle. We have continued to refine our process of metrics or objective measures of our effectiveness we will use in getting the best equipment available into the hands of our warfighter.
In summary, we are committed to providing our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines the best technology and equipment at the right place at the right time and at the right cost. This concludes my opening remarks. I'm pleased to answer any questions from the members of the subcommittee. Mr. Parker, would you proceed? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members. Uh, my name is Michael Parker. I'm the Deputy Commander of the U.S. Army Soldier Biological and Chemical Command. My boss, Major General John Dozberg, has a number of responsibilities in the ChemBio Defense Program, uh, two of major significance to your hearing today. Uh, th that is, uh, he heads a, a group of component service general officers who are responsible for the planning, uh, programming, and budgeting for the materiel, that is the equipment which is developed un under and procured under the ChemBio Defense Program. Uh, and he has the laboratory structure which provides the technology and the engineering support to the project managers that were outlined in Major General Bond's discussion uh, in the acquisition process. Uh, I'd like to just touch on uh, about a half a dozen of over 150 projects and work packages that encompass the ChemBio Defense Program as far as equipment and technology development. Uh, these six focus on the issue today of uh, that this uh, committee is pursuing today of individual protection. Uh, the Joint Service Protective Mask is a current development mask to replace the fielded M40 mask in the MCU-2P. It is a uh, significant improvement over the field mask, providing a much lighter mask, a, uh, a better fit factor, a larger lens to improve visibility and compatibility with weapon systems, significantly reduce breathing uh, resistance uh, to reduce the burden on the, uh, on the soldier, sailor, airman, or marine who would wear this in a combat environment. Uh, it also considers observations uh, by this panel, uh, this committee, uh, many of the audit agencies and what of our, our own uh, uh, internal uh, Army and other service uh, uh, reviews uh, in, the, in the area of reducing the, the burden on preventive maintenance in a field environment. The design is such that it is much more robust and will reduce the burden on the user uh, to continually maintain the equipment. Uh, it will also replace all of the, the ground masks such that the services will have a single mask uh, reducing the total ownership cost and logistics burden. We anticipate an initial feeling of that mask in about um, fiscal year 06. Uh, the next item is a Joint Service Chemical Environment Survivability Mask, which is a mask that the combatant commanders and field forces have asked for, which is de uh, designed to provide a capability in a uh, reduced threat environment. Uh, the individual protective equipment uh, that uh, is fielded now is designed against the, uh, the maximum threat. There are many conditions where the threat is present, but the concentration of chemical and biological agents would be much reduced. This piece of equipment is designed for a, to be a small, uh, single-use item uh, capable of pr protecting uh, for a short duration uh, at a significantly reduced burden. We'd anticipate feeling that in the 05 time frame. Uh, the Joint Service Aircrew Mask will be a standard uh, mask for high-performance aircraft. Uh, replacing uh, a number of masks that are fielded primarily between the Air Force and the Navy. It will be fully compatible with all of the, uh, the high-G, uh, high-pressure systems that are on high-performance aircraft, uh, re also reducing to a single mask to reduce the logistics burden. We anticipate fielding in the 06 time frame. Uh, the Joint Service Mass uh, Leakage Tester is a uh, system uh, that will be able to test masks to production standards uh, in a small compact piece of equipment that will be man portable and will be uh, much easier to take to the field and uh, conduct that operation in the field. We anticipate feeling that in the 03 time frame. Uh, the Joint Service Protective Aircrew Ensemble is an extension of the, uh, of the lightweight suit technology program uh, to create an, a suit specifically uh, oriented towards uh, air crews and the environment that they have to operate in. That will also be a, an 05 fielding. Uh, service lightweight integrated suit technology uh, ensemble, uh, which has been discussed somewhat today, is a program of a continuous nature 
where new materials will be continually introduced in the, uh, in the ensemble uh, to reduce the burden, the heat stress, the weight of the suit, improve performance uh, such as laundrability, wear and tear, uh, the, uh, replace the, the current series of three, uh, three gloves with a single set of gloves, uh, that type of a continuous improvement. It will also be compatible with the, uh, 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 maintain compatibility with the new general purpose mask. One of the additional challenges uh, which uh, we continuously uh, uh, introduce into uh, equipment is the recognition that uh, we, we're facing threats or our forces will face threats in the field beyond the traditional chemical warfare agents and biological warfare agents. Uh, Toxic industrial chemicals can be diverted and can present a challenge uh, to our field forces if purposely em uh, employed or as released as a collateral effect as we operate in urban terrain where there may be large chemical plants or storage of chemical materials uh, that are industrial in nature but nonetheless very toxic. Uh, we are in, uh, expanding the uh, protection capability of all our fielded systems to deal with these toxic in, uh, industrial chemicals. With that, let me uh, summarize and, uh, and open for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Mr. Allen. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Kucinich and distinguished members. I am George Allen representing uh, Vice Admiral Keith Lippert, who is Director of the Defense Logistics Agency. I appreciate this opportunity to come before this committee to address your concerns concerning uh, individual protective equipment and supplies used against the chem bio attack. Now, and I... Put the microphone closer to you, please. Shall I begin again? Good morning, sir. That's no. right. Go ahead. Uh, I have submitted a written statement for the record. Yes. Which I'd like submitted. We'll accept it for the record. In your invitation to testify, you requested that we address the progress we have made with respect to uh, equipment inventories, quality controls, serviceability for the battle dress overgarment and the JS list suit in particular. You also asked that we address or uh, focus on the effective management, proper maintenance, ready availability, and the on-hand status of both the equipment and supplies. And in response to these questions, I hope to make three very, very important points to this committee. First, we will do everything in our power to prevent the outrageous criminal conduct that resulted in the presence of defective BDOs in our inventories in years past. We have re-emphasized especially rigorous quality assurance measures in our contracting for these items. And we continuously monitor the shelf life of all <coughs> such items in conjunction with the program manager and the military services. Second, we have significantly improved our visibility of inventory over these items. And finally, we maintain very close working relationship with the program manager and our customers to ensure as much integration of these items as we can. The most significant chemical and biological protective items we have bought in behalf of the services are the BDOs, battle dress overgarments, the JS list suits mentioned by Mr. Parker, and the chemical gloves, although there are a number of other items. We store a large number of these items on behalf of the customers in our depots. We are now able to manage the shelf life of these because we've begun to store these items in lots by their shelf life expiration dates. We plan to expand this capability to managing these items by a specific manufacturing lot as we implement our new enter enterprise resource planning system. The quality assurance and shelf life surveillance provisions that we have implemented for JS Lit suits in particular represent a significant improvement over those we used for BDOs in years past. We have expanded the shelf life surveillance provisions to everything that is also in the inventory. We work closely with the military services and their agency and other agencies in this effort. We take random samples from every JS list lot that is manufactured to uh, undertake further testing and quality control uh, before government acceptance. The component manufacturers have to provide a certificate of compliance before the components are provided to the prime contractors. Prime contractors have to inspect those components. Then they have to perform inspections throughout the uh, manufacturing process as part of our contract. Defense Contract Management Agency quality assurance representatives are, are part of this process and we employ independent labs that perform live agent testing on the end item 
uh, as opposed to on the uh, uh, individual pieces of, uh, of material. <coughs> Similar procedures are also in place for newly purchased items and for uh, some of the shelf life uh, procedures are in place for items that remain in the inventory. Overall management of individual protective equipment used for chem bio defense is really the responsibility of the program manager. Oversight is provided by Dr. Winnegar as she has maintained. We maintain a close working relationship with the program manager in our role of acquiring and warehousing these items. Over the past decade, we have provided several million suits to the military services. There are currently over four million suits in the inventory, according to the program manager and as testified to by GIO. That four million suits includes approximately 1.5 million JS list suits, and there are several hundred thousand more JS list suits on contract not yet delivered. In the event of a contingency, we can surge production to 1.4 million suits annually. Our current replenishment requirements for gloves in the aggregate are approximately 1 million pairs annually. And we are negotiating contracts with surge capacity of up to 2.5 million <coughs> pair of gloves per year. Switching to medical supplies, which was uh, uh, mentioned also in your letter, we use similar processes to uh, work with the DOD and determine requirements and to contract for those medical supplies. We currently have contract coverage to meet the requirements for all the services in the event of a single major theater of war, and we're expanding that capability to a larger scenario should it be required. Uh, these contracts guarantee availability of up to $630 million worth of material if we ref uh, exercise all the refresh options in the contract. And as I've said, this is uh, the equivalent to a single major theater of war. Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, we're working closely with the services to ensure integrated management of the chem bio protective items in a way we were not two years ago. We have re-emphasized and strengthened our quality assurance measures to ensure that products comply with the technical requirements for the items, and we monitor the shelf life of all these items in our inventories over time. And finally, Mr. Chairman, we have made some significant improvements in our visibility of the inventories of these items and we're poised to realize much more significant advances as our agency deploys its new enterprise resource planning system. Subject to your questions, that concludes my testimony. Thank you. We're going to be calling on, on um, uh, Mr. Gilman. I, I would just say that the one part that I want you to address is this in issue of who's responsible for inventory because, you, I, frankly, I felt like you were just throwing it right back to Dr. Winnegar, and I, I just I tend to feel that that basically, um, Mr. Allen, it really rests in, in your, your agency. And just before we ask questions again, really we asked just to give a shape to this panel. We, we asked Dr. Winterger to be here, who is the program manager. And the life cycle as we go through, we, we look at y y you, General Goldfein, as, as being responsible for the issue of requirements. Mr. Bond, uh, General Bond, excuse me, uh, the issue of acquisition and and the testing and training, Mr. Parker, kind of in your area, and then the logistics kind of in your area, Mr. Allen. That's kind of how I view this panel, and if I'm inaccurate about that, I'll need to be straightened out. Um, and I will also say, Ms. Uh, General Goldfein, that, that, um, that I was waiting for you to read in your statement on page tr 3, approval of all ACAT-1 ORDs rests with the JROCs. And I, I figured that every other... Every two words you had an anachronism, and we only allow two per sentence. <laughs> so you didn't give me the pleasure of interrupting you then. Okay, Ben, you're, Mr. Gilman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to uh, commend the panel for concentrating on trying to have better inventories and better quality material. However, this panel, uh, our committee, is concerned about testimony we received at our first panel. In their prepared testimony, GAO stated that the Department of Defense could not easily identify, track, and locate defective suits because inventory records do not always include contract and lot numbers. And in May uh, of 2000, DOD directed units and de depots to locate some se over 700,000 defective suits produced by a single manufacturer and as of July 2002, as many as 250,000 of those suits remained unaccounted for. 
I'd welcome some comment from all of you. The DOD IG stated the Defense Logistics Agency, DLA, reported to the DOD OIG that DLA believed that the 250,000 unaccounted for BDOs were issued, worn, and disposed of. DLA also reported that based on repeated messages and advisories and through incentives to their customers, DLA believed any remaining defective BDOs were identified and pull out of serviceable inventories. Once segregated, the defective BDOs were to be used solely for training. However, according to the IG, not all units have received that information from higher headquarters. And as recently as April of this year, the IG continued to identify units that had not segregated the defective BDOs. Why does DOD continue to have defective BDOs in unit inventories? And why have some of those units not received the advisories regarding these defective BDOs? And how can DOD ensure defective BDOs are not going to be located and used in, in theater as we prepare for hostile action. And you will note for the record that members of Congress can use acronyms uh, as many as they want in a sentence. And I want you to know it would be very helpful if you could uh, give us a, uh, a summary of all of those acronyms so that we would have be better advised. But please, I address that to all of the panel. Who's prepared to respond to that? You've made uh, extensive <clears throat> comments about the history and your agencies and how well prepared you were. What are we doing about these defective units? Do you want to ask each of those three questions again separately? Sure. Why does the DOD continue to have defective BDOs in their unit inventories? Who would like to venture? I Mr. Think Allen? Sir, I think the best way to answer your question is to reiterate for you what we have done to attempt to purge inventories. Yeah, of but I, I know what you're trying to do. Why, why are these defective units still there? Uh, the, the inventories which sit out there at the unit level, as you have noted and the prior panelists have noted, are the control of the commanders. Um, uh, if the word has not gotten down to the commanders, if the commanders have not cleared out their inventories, if they have not taken the incentive to return those units to us, that would be the reason why there may be... Well, who's responsible for doing that, if not you f uh, five panelists who are in charge of all of this? Uh, the, uh, the unit commanders, uh, through their chain of command, are responsible for the uh, inventories within their control, sir. But if they're not responding... Isn't that the responsibility of you panelists to make sure they are responding? You're in charge of in inventories. You say you want the troops to be better prepared, to be fully equipped to go into hostility. Could the gentleman suspend a second. Mr. Allen, you, but basically the question is directed at you because you're in charge of the logistics. And we need an answer to the question of why. And it's really not directed, I don't think, to all the panelists here yet unless you can direct us to someone in this panel that it should be directed at. Um, you're in charge of logistics, and we need to know why defective equipment is still out there, and that's the question. He wants to know why. I, I, all I can tell you, sir, is that the way the inventory process works is that we purchase this inventory uh, under the auspices of the program manager. We supply it to the unit commanders, not all of it, but some of it, we supply it to the unit commanders, and at that point, custody of that inventory uh, passes to the unit commanders. And it Mr. Allen, is there some defective equipment now in the hands of the unit commanders? Uh, sir, I cannot say for certain that there is or there is not. Uh, we have said what we have tried to do to purge all the inventory. Uh, I cannot give you any better answer than that, sir. Why have some units not received the advisories regarding these, this defective equipment? We provided the uh, information through the program manager, through the military services, down through the chain of command. And if the chain of command, uh, if, if there was a failure of communication there, sir, I do not know how to address that. Well, again, to the entire panel, if there's defective equipment out there, and if the unit commanders are not trying to cleanse that defective equipment from their units, don't you have some responsibility to make certain that our troops are going to be 
uh, out on the battlefield without defective equipment. And I, again, I address that to the entire panel. <laughs> you folks are in charge of providing decent equipment. And you said in your testimony, your major objective is to make certain that our troops have the kind of equipment they need. Mr. Goodman, we... General we, Bond. Yeah, you, you, Yes, Congressman, we do take this very seriously, and I can speak personally from personal experience, uh, but I can also tell you from my current job that the program manager working through the Defense Logistics Agency makes inventories, goes out and checks with the unit commander, tries to find and, and identify these stocks that have not been turned in, tries to make sure that these, these uh, bulletins are provided to the commanders. Uh, I think that the Defense Logistics Agency's incentive programs had made it to those commanders that are looking for ways in which to further their capability by, uh, by, uh, by turning this in can acquire additional resources uh, is a great way in which to try to do it. Uh, and a help with the GAO and other uh, audit agencies, even within our own internal IG ranks, have gone out and tried to identify within these units those units which have failed to uh, provide uh, or return these uh, and turn in these uh, uh, defective garments. We will continue to do that. We're not going to give up on it, Congressman. General Bond, we're approaching... E day or whatever day you want to call it when we're going to be confronting Iraq. We have 250,000 uh, defective units that are not a, 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 a identified or uh, found in, uh, in our inventories. Aren't you fellows concerned about that? Yes, sir, and, and we will continue to work to try to identify any of those. Uh, I tend to agree with uh, Mr. Allen that uh, most of those, if not all, have been purged out of the system through the normal training process. Yes, that there's probably uh, uh, the possibility that some may be lingering out there, but I would uh, almost uh, guarantee from personal experience that they would not be in high-priority units. They would have to be in a unit that was, that was not training all the time for which those kind of stocks were not brought up. GAO uh, has stated that some of them may be lingering in a warehouse, but you need some manpower to identify them. Uh, Why aren't we applying that? The warehouses, you'd have to, to discuss with uh, Mr. Allen, but I know within the well, units... Mr. Allen, what do you say about uh, that? We do have a... Uh, we have turned in all the suits... That, all the suits that we've received, we have uh, segregated or are in the process of, process of destroying them so they cannot fall into the hands of uh, soldiers who might uh, um, inadvertently use them, uh, thinking that they were to be protected. Uh, the warehouses... The gentleman yield on this one. Please please to yield to the chairman. Why, why wouldn't we take those that are defective, clearly mark them, put a big X on them or whatever, and use them for training? Why would we destroy them? We went through a, a significant discussion on exactly that point, sir, and given the sensitivity of those items, we decided to take the ones which were defective and destroy them so that there would be no possibility that they would ever, under any way, uh, find their way into, uh, into someone's hands. Um, it was a, it was a, it was an absolutely a conscious decision, and it was not made lightly. But the sad thing about that decision, though, because you could make it so noticeable that you wouldn't have to ever fear they would be used improperly. Um, I am constantly being asked to appropriate more money uh, and to uh, reckon we, the committee, members of Congress, to um, make sure that our troops practice with live ordnance. We also want to make sure that they practice, I don't mean practice, that they train with live ordnance, that they, they train with, with equipment that is the same equipment they would use in the battle. And to me, this is nonsensical, what you just told me, that they would destroy it. Sir, one of the, one of the in, in accordance with that exact thought, we took the ones that, uh, the suits that were not determined to be effective, defective, but had been, uh, had expired shelf life. And we do use those suits for training only. We take them out of their vacuum sealed bag. We mark them very clearly with uh, big black ink for training only, but we chose not to do that with the, uh, the suits which were determined to be defective because we simply didn't want any possibility that they might be used. Thank you, Mr. Gibbon. What are your comments then about GAO's uh, report that there's still 250,000 defective uh, uh, pieces of equipment that have not been identified or found? What is your response to that? Uh, the response, sir, is that I can reiterate the actions we have taken to attempt to identify, to account for. Have you accounted? All have, you, have you accounted for the two hundred and fifty thousand? We have accounted for five hundred and fifty thousand out of the eight hundred that we did issue uh, over the past ten years. We have not accounted for the two hundred fifty thousand which were issued and have not been turned in. 
So what are we doing to account for those? Uh, as recently as last month, we provided uh, uh, another notice to the, uh, all the military customers through the military services to turn those suits in if they had them out there, to screen their inventories again, turn them in. We provided transportation funds to, for them to utilize so that they could do it at no cost as one of the ways we attempt we attempt to incentivize them to turn that material in should it be found out there. Well, I'm asking our entire panel, are you satisfied that tomorrow, if we go to battle with Iraq, that there would be no defective equipment out on the battlefield? I think there's a very low degree of risk of defective uh, Isratex suits out on the battlefield, sir. Despite the fact that you can't locate 250,000 of these defective units? That is my assessment, sir. Well, I addressed our other panelists. What are your thoughts about that? There's 250,000 defective pieces of equipment that haven't been located. Are you assured that these are not out on the battlefield? Well, sir, I don't, I don't think that there is a perfect assurance if that's what this committee is looking for. And, and I'm personally appreciative of the comments that were provided earlier by the GAO and the DODIG on uh, the uh, effort that would be needed to individually account for every single item in the inventory. Uh, I cannot tell you this morning whether the DOD is prepared to undertake that level of uh, assessment or not. Uh, I, I do share your concern. Uh, I, I would be uh, very upset if an individual service member were to go into an environment facing chemical and biological um, weapons in defective gear. Uh, none of us on this panel, none of us from the Department of Defense would like to face a situation like that. Um, and I wanted to assure you that, that I certainly support the DLA in their efforts to, uh, to make an assessment of the inventory, and we will continue to pursue that uh, until we are satisfied. Well, I hope you will. This is a, an Im a imminent situation that could happen tomorrow, next week, and yet we have some 250,000 defective suits out there that should be removed from the uh, hostile area, and I hope that you're going to find a way to do that, and I direct that to all of the panelists. Sir, I, I would just like to clarify that, that the number is somewhere between zero and 250,000, and I don't know that any of us today can tell you that there are 250,000 defective suits anywhere in the well, Mr. Allen just testified out of the 800,000, you've found about 500,000, so there, it must be in that range. Any other comments by any of our panelists with regard to our query? If not, my final urgency, urgent message is Let's get rid of these defective units and not allow our troops to be out on the battlefield with defective body suits. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gilman. Um, Mr. Kucinich, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome our two members, uh, Ms. Sikowski and Mr. Allen, who have both come. I know they have been very busy on other things, but happy to have you here, Mr. Kucinich. In, uh in the, in the testimony by the uh, IG's office, they said that the Defense Logistic Agency reported to us that they believe that the 250,000 unaccounted for overgarments that are at issue here were issued, worn, and disposed of. Now, uh, Dr. Uh, Weiniger, uh, just said that, Weiniger that just said that the number is anywhere from zero to 250,000. Uh, there's a contrast here with the IG's report and, and the Defense Logistics Agency's account. Do you want to reconcile it? Sir, I believe that the uh, DLA testimony was that of 800,000 uh, uh, items that were determined to be defective, that they have made a positive accounting for 550,000 of those at this time. Is that correct, Mr. Allen? Yes, sir. I, well, I'm asking a question, sir, thanks. Okay. So I, I, would, I would like to say that uh, we're still then on the record saying there are 250,000 unaccounted for suits 
And you're saying it could be anywhere from zero to 250,000, but it could be 250,000. That's correct. Okay. Now, uh, at the end of the last panel, Mr. Decker of the GAO said that the Defense Department had been extremely slow in reviewing GAO's work for classification concerns. He said this process has slowed to the point that sensitive and timely GAO reports that relate directly to this chemical and biological area are being significantly delayed, in some cases by as much as two or three months. So, Doctor, why is the Defense Department slowing and delaying its review of GAO reports regarding chemical and biological vulnerabilities? Sir, I'd like to say for the record that I do not believe the Department is deliberately slowing its review uh, of any such reports. <laughs> I, I think it attests to the fact that we are taking this uh, issue very seriously and providing a very thorough and very comprehensive review by many different offices within uh, the Department of Defense. And that does require uh, a certain amount of time so that each and every individual who brings their own area of expertise to bear on the question does have adequate time to uh, provide that level of review. Now, uh, the people at this table are the Defense Department's top experts on chemical and biological dangers. Uh, is the cause of the delays in reviewing the GAO reports, is this the panel that's the cause of it? You want to you answer? You, you could go right down the line, yes or no. Sir, my office is one of, of many offices that has provided an opportunity to review and comment on the GAO report. Um, and depending on, on the length and the complexity of that report, as I said, I think it is incumbent upon us to provide our very best assessment of that. Uh, I hope you'll appreciate the, uh, the workload that, that all of us have and the care and consideration which we want to give to this report. Uh, I can only speak personally for my own office. Uh, I do not have direct control over many other offices in the Department of Defense who do uh, the security review, who do the intelligence assessment, yeah, I, I, et cetera. You know, I'm, I'm going to say that your answer is non-responsive. Now, this is serious concern. The GAO is Congress's investigative arm, and we rely on them to provide us with critical information on vulnerabilities and dangers which the servicemen and women <laughs> serving this country face. And we depend on them for independent and unbiased reporting. Now, Mr. Chairman, at the start of the hearing, uh, we heard Mr. Schmitz, the Inspector General, made an offer to this committee to investigate any irregularities or improper actions by the Defense Department in their classification procedure. I mean, in view of the fact that we have uh, Mr. Decker stating that the Defense Department has been extremely slow in reviewing GAO's work for classification concerns, and since there is a question here of, of a timely and, and uh, GAO reports that relate directly to, to chemical and biological um, uh, preparedness, and since we know they're being significantly delayed, and since this panel and, and the gentle lady has not made a case uh, for the reason for the delay, and considering the critical nature of this moment, when this country may well be at the threshold of sending our men and women into a region where biological and chemical weapons could be used, it seems to me that this subcommittee uh, should request that the Inspector General uh, investigate and report on the claims that the GAO made. And I just want to uh, offer this for the consideration of the Chair and the members of this committee uh, because it seems that this is a matter that needs to be pursued. Now, um, Mr. Chairman, how much time do I have remaining? How much time do this gentleman have remaining? Four minutes. How much? You have a generous four minutes. You can go a little over. Well, there, there is a finding, uh, Doctor, in the GAO's unclassified report that is particularly troubling. On page 8, they describe a situation in which the Pentagon is, quote, understating the real risk, unquote, to our service members. And, just let me ask you a quick series of questions on this. First of all, do you concede that the Defense Department has understated the real risk?
I'm directing it to Dr. Uh, to me. Winnegar. Um, I think that, that you have to put the uh, estimation of the risk in the proper context, and I'd appreciate if you could read the entire sentence. Okay, this is from page 8, the GAO report. Sir, I was not provided a copy of that report until this morning. Excuse me, this is, this is a statement, a report is a, this is the statement of the GAO before us. Uh, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, since you haven't been provided with a copy, I'm going to read from the copy. Sir, I would like to ask, uh, enter into the record that we did ask for an advanced copy of this so that I could be prepared to answer your questions and no copy was provided but, to be but you know, this morning. But may I ask uh, in, re, you know, in reply whether or not uh, it would be appropriate to ask you to answer questions based on things that are certainly within your yeah. operational knowledge. So certainly. I'm, uh, okay. The GAO said <coughs> that we reported that the, um, they're citing previous circumstances where they found that the DOD had inaccurately reported the risk, in most cases as, as low, and having reported that the process for determining risk is fundamentally flawed because, one, the DOD determines requirements by individual pieces of protective equipment, suits, masks, breathing filters, gloves, boots, and hoods, rather than by the number of complete protective ensembles that can be provided to deploying service members. And they go on to say, number two, the process for determining risk combines individual service requirements and reported inventory data into general categories, masking specific critical shortages that affect individual service readiness. <coughs> and he goes on to conclude, had DOD <laughs> assessed the risk on the basis of the number of complete ensembles it had available by service, the risk would have risen too high for all the services. So the question comes again, do you concede? that the Department of Defense has understated the real risk. I, I agree with the GAO's um, <coughs> assessment of how the risk should be calculated. Uh, I also agree that this is the GAO assessment of what the risk would be if that recalculation were done. The Department of Defense is in the process of redoing that calculation ourselves, uh, and I agree that it will probably change from our previous recommendation. Uh, so, so you're redoing the calculation. That's okay, correct. So, that's so correct. you know, we're, on, we're, we're at the threshold, uh, possibly, of an invasion of Iraq, and the calculations are being redone. That's fine. Now, do you concede, as the um, GAO does, that the data the department has used is fundamentally flawed? No, I do not. Do you concede that the department has, quote, quoting from the GAO, inaccurately reported the risk in most cases as low. That, that relates to the method that was used for calculating the risk, and I have already uh, agreed that, that we agree now with the GAO on a different way to calculate well, the risk. That, that's fine. Then do you, uh, rather than a low risk, do you agree with the GAO that, in fact, the risk is high? I'm not prepared to say that it's high. I'm prepared to say that it is probably different than our original calculation, but we have not. So it's, so it's not low? Probably not. Because you're re and, and because you know it's not low, you're recalculating. Could it be high? It could be. Okay. Uh, why does the DOD insist on ignoring the GAO and making statements like those made by General Myers in which Obviously, the risk is being understated. The risk to our servicemen and women is being understated. Why, why does the GAO make statements like that? Since this is something that is so important, like we're talking about the security of our men and women. I, I think that the GAO statement uh, relates to one particular item, and in this particular case, we're talking about the uh, protective ensemble for chemical biological defense. Uh, without knowing uh, General Meyer's entire statement and, again, uh, putting that into the proper context, uh, I believe that the uh, availability and readiness of chemical biological protective ensembles is but one piece of the overall assessment of readiness. Well, well one piece is certainly the suit itself, correct? 
That's correct. And if there are holes in, in, in the suit and tears in the seams, uh, that's, was that of concern to you? Absolutely. And there's 250,000 of those suits, is that correct, that are out there? Yes. And you don't know where they are, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, but the DOD has claimed miraculous, miraculously, even though they don't know where those suits are, that they've all been accounted for, that they've all been issued, worn, and disposed of. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate your uh, generosity with the time, and I'm, uh, I have another set of questions if we get to that point. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we have um, Mr. Kaus oh, Mr. Tierney. Mr. Tierney, you have the floor. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to see my colleagues get an opportunity to question, so I, I want to be brief. But I, which one of, of you folks would uh, be dealing with training? Would that be you, Mr. Parker? Mr. Tierney, I'm uh, really connected with the uh, with the acquisition side as well. I think of the panel members here in their current capacities. Uh, they're, uh, we're lacking someone who who would address training as a, a functional specialty. Okay. The, uh, Mr. Tierney, certainly I, cramps one style of question, doesn't it? Uh, perhaps not. In the um, in this joint requirements office that I indicated to you earlier, we have just formed up and are looking forward to new ways of, of developing requirements for the department. <coughs> Training falls in a, in a category of activities that we'll look at. I'd be happy to attempt to, to follow through then with whatever your question was. Well, let me, let me ask you. I don't want to put you at a disadvantage in that, but I'm, I'm curious to know is, is to, in your opinion then, are you able to make an assessment as to whether or not an adequate number of people have been trained, but men and women have been trained uh, for involvement in a venture that might take us to Iraq? I would not be able to judge the, that overall picture, sir, but what I can, I can tell you perhaps is, is a couple of other points, and one relates to Mr. Gilman's earlier question. There is a, a very uh, consistent process of, of reporting from levels of command all the way down to fairly small units. You've heard of the name. It's another one of our acronyms called SORTS. It's a status of, a status of readiness and training of units. And an, an item that has been required uh, uh, in that category now for the past, I believe, about a year and a half has been the, uh, the status of the chem biodefense equipment that a unit would have <laughs> and the status of the training of the unit. So I think it would be safe to draw a conclusion that if a unit reported uh, its status as, as fully capable, which would include equipment and training, and if, in fact, a series of units were selected to, to, uh, to uh, participate in any activity, the one you s that you mentioned could be one of those, and all of them had reported ready, then, in fact, everyone who showed up would be prepared to deal with the situation. And I guess what I'm getting is we're not quite sure yet whether everybody that would be asked to show up would meet that criteria of readiness, and that, that's what I was getting at, but I'm not sure you're able to answer that. I'm, not, I'm simply not able to answer that question, sir. Should we be concerned, uh, General, with the fact that we uh, recently apparently conducted the uh, Millennium Challenge 2002, the, the uh, warfare scenarios that mocked the situation that we might expect to find in a possible war with Iraq, that during those exercises, uh, we did not get involved at all with the, any lethal biological or chemical, chemical agents or any scenarios under which those would be launched against our troops. In terms of you know, readiness and, and training, wouldn't we expect that that kind of a uh, mock exercise would, in fact, engage in, in those types of activities so that we could assess our training level and our performance level? Yes, sir. I would answer in, in two ways. First, I'm not personally familiar with the Millennium Challenge, so I'd, I'd be it would be uh, improper for me to attempt to judge that. I just don't know if it was invo uh, what was involved in the exercise. I will tell you from general experience, though, that we never get everything done in every exercise, but in a, cl in a collection of exercises over time, we get at everything. It could well be that this particular one was focused for some reason on some area and that there is another exercise of great import that was conducted. Um, to cover that subject. And again, I would speak to my own experience in various combat units. I, I say this not to engage you necessarily, but just for the record, because I'm reading off of reports uh, about those exercises that basically indicate that uh, Paul Van Riper, who's the retired Marine Lieutenant General, who was playing the enemy's military commander during that time, fully anticipated that he was going to be able to use them, and he asked to use chemical weapons, and he said he was refused on that, and that, uh, so it seems that it clearly was something that at least it was anticipated, that they were trying to do a full exercise of what uh, might have been uh, met at that point in time, 
and we're, uh, no, I know. we're refused. I have some concerns of that, but I clearly don't want to put you at a disadvantage. Mr. Chairman, I know I sent a letter to you asking whether or not we were going to have the opportunity to question people that might have been engaged with that exercise. Do you know whether or not we're going to be able to do that and, and when we might be able to do that? Uh, the gentleman has asked, uh, the question is, I don't think in the next month, only because we may be here only two weeks and we already have schedules, but if you're asking me should we have a hearing, absolutely, and would I be prepared, uh, even if I'm in the minority next year, to have a hearing this year after uh, when we get back, I'd be happy to and happy to work on a hearing with the gentleman. I so thank you. I, my only concern is it, it certainly would think that we'd want to do it sooner rather than later, well, only we because we ought to know why we're not, why people were stopped from exploring those avenues at a time when we definitely ought to be able to see whether or not we're prepared ready to go. In, we, in terms of two things, we wanted to focus in on the issues we're focusing in on now, and some people couldn't come. The people you asked originally could not come today. Uh, we asked them that. But the bottom line is, uh, you have identified a, a very logical hearing for this committee, and I would be happy to work with you to have one. <coughs> and obviously, I know the sooner the better. I can just tell you, though, if I'm not here in the next two weeks, I'm not going to be here for the next five weeks. <laughs> okay. Um, just, uh, Mr. Allen, a, a question on the, the number of suits. I don't want to beat that question to death, but I just want to clarify one point. The number of suits that uh, are in our inventory now, protective gear, I thought I heard you say um, one and a half million. Uh, no. Um, no. In, in fact, perhaps, perhaps I can help uh, <coughs> clarify the whole issue of uh, the unaccounted for suits. If you go back to 1989, <coughs> when the first defective suits were produced by a company named Misratex, since that time we have issued several million suits to the military services for use in Desert Storm, Bosnia, etc. Of those several million suits that were issued over that period of time, Maybe up to million. today, um, the 800,000 were Isratex suits. Uh, of those several million suits, uh, 1.5 million are new JS list suits. Okay, are you saying several or seven million? Several, several. million or seven? Several. I could. Because I, I thought you earlier quoted would, four million. Is the, is the no, I'm. I'm going to. I'm going to try to step you through the whole process in an attempt to <coughs> clarify the issue of where we are with respect to accountability for suits. We have issued several million. I would estimate it's six to eight million suits over that period of time. Of those uh, several million suits, eight hundred thousand are Isertex suits. Um, of those several million suits, another 1.5 million were current new JS list suits. The balance were other BDOs by other manufacturers. There are, we can clearly tell, there are about 4 million suits in the system today. So some millions of suits have been consumed. Some hundreds of thousands, millions of suits have been consumed since 1989. Because we went through such a rigorous process on multiple occasions to recall the very specific suits which were found to be defective, and because we know that there have been consumed three to four million suits over that period of time, we have a relatively high level of confidence that we have captured the defective Isratex suits. The problem that we stand before this committee with is we cannot account for the Isratex suits on a one-for-one -one basis. Uh, there is, uh, short of some individual putting their eye on every single suit in the system today, we would not be able to ever make that statement. And so I guess I hope that clarifies what. Well, it helps someone. I want to thank you, but it still gets us to the number of the 800,000 Isratex suits. 250,000 have yet to be accounted for, and you're assuming that some place between zero and 250,000 have washed out in the general usage of, of training and That is exactly else. correct, sir. Right. So zero to 250,000 leaves us with a pretty high margin out there. It leaves us with anywhere between, well, as high as 16% of our suits that are out there if it's a whole 250,000. So that would be pretty dramatic. It would seem to me that, that somewhere, uh, Dr. Winnegar, probably starting with you and then through, Dr., through Mr. Allen on down, somebody would have the responsibility to then say, I want those 250,000 suits, and here's the plan, and, and move it down there. So what is the plan to get those 250,000 suits, identify them, and take them off the shelf? Um, at this point, we have uh, repeatedly gone out to the services through the existing communications that. channels 
and asked for it, a hundred percent of identification of those suits. And we think we have recovered all of them. Well, you, you, if you counted them, you, you're 250,000 short. So we know that you haven't got them all. Because I assume that when you went out and asked for them, you then counted the number that you had a response for. And that's how you got from the 800,000 down to 250, right? If the suits have been consumed, they can't identify them to us. Right. They can't turn them into us. All right. So you don't, so you have no way of telling, you're telling me whether they've been consumed or not is what it comes to. And so you don't know, well, your problem is that you don't know whether the people on the, the, the unit level are being responsive or not. You don't we, know whether they cannot can identify them, you don't know what they can, so until those suits go out by, um, just by the fact of uh, expiring or something of that nature, you're, you're not ever going to be certain. We will never be able to make positive identification unless we can actually put our hands on 250,000 suits. When will be the last expiration date for those, or the last of those suits? Um, How long are they anticipated for, to live? Uh, let me uh, think for one minute. The, uh, the last, the first, the final expiration date for the suits purchased or manufactured in the 1989 contract would be probably this year or next year, and uh, two years hence for the suits manufactured in the 92 contract, or three years hence. So it would be an expiration date. But when the, the expiration date comes, do, do you have just a regular routine where those suits are then taken off the shelf, mock training units, and, and moved on? Yes, and it's the same routine we use to identify suits that we want to recall. So we won't be certain for another several years that we've got them all. The only way we'll be certain is when that time period comes and you have some certainty that all of the manufactured suits for those particular years have been marked training, taken off the shelf, and used for training only. Yes, sir. Okay. The... And you have in place now a system moving forward. I was taking note of uh, Mr. Decker's chart indicating that the expiration date uh, is, it seems to be happening at one pace and the replacement uh, rate at another. Uh, we have some plan in place, I hope, to make sure that we get those numbers up. And can you tell us what that is and what you're doing? Uh, yes, we have a, uh, we've done a number of things to increase the uh, capacity to produce suits. We have added manufacturers and we've added uh, uh, one of the limiters for producing suits is the liner itself, the lining material. We've added, uh, there's a separate plant now in production, uh, and we're looking at another manufacturer of that as well in an attempt to increase our production capacity. Uh, we are replacing suits at a rate which today could replace up to the... Because it's a timely response. Are these domestic manufacturers or are they overseas? Uh, the end item manufacturer is are all domestic manufacturers. The uh, liner material itself is originally made by a plant in Germany who has established a second plant in the United States. And we are looking at an additional manufacturer of a, uh, of a comparable material to establish itself in the United States. And are any suits made overseas? No suits are made overseas. Any materials made overseas? Yes, some material is made overseas. If I hadn't asked you that second point about suits and then gone to material, would you have volunteered that the material was made overseas? Uh, certainly, if, the, uh, if, the, if, if it came up in the conversation. I mean, I... Yeah, I just, I mean, sometimes we don't always... It is, not a, it is not an issue that I'm, I, I have any uh, <coughs> concern about revealing, sir. Yeah, and, yeah, in this day and age of terrorism, I have a concern about where they're made. And, uh, and we do too, sir, yeah. which is why we are looking to expand our industrial capacity to... to Right. Operate solely on our own. And that's why it's pertinent that they are, in fact, being made overseas, the material. Gentlemen, this uh, light has been on for a while. Now, one more question then, and then uh, we did, uh, Dr. Winnegar, um, we talked about the process for assessing risks, and you agreed that it was somewhat flawed and that you were going to uh, take corrective measures to come up with new risk assessments. That's correct. Right. When do you think that will be fully implemented so that you're able to look at all of the entire ensemble, as uh, Mr. Decker was saying, and give us an assessment as to whether it's low risk, no risk, high risk, or medium risk? Well, we're certainly in the process of doing that now, and it would be no later than when we submit our next annual report to Congress, which would be uh, early February, but hopefully before that. When you say hopefully before that, I mean the end of this year or just like January instead of February? Hopefully by the end of this year. By the end of this year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to recognize myself and, and yield in a second to Mr. Platts, but one of the previous hearings we had on the whole issue of, of what terrorists could do in our, in our ports, uh, both our bulk ports and our c uh, container ports, we also had a hearing on how we ship um, uh, our own military hardware overseas, and 90 percent 
of what we ship goes over um, uh, what we send overseas. Ninety percent, uh, we learn, goes by non-U.S. carriers, which is of concern. And that's, and I'm, you know, happy, Mr. Allen, that you're identifying this concern as well, wanting to make sure something so important is made in the United States. I am, I am wrestling with, uh, well, before I tell you what I'm wrestling with, I'm going to go with Mr. Platts, and then, uh, then I'll see how much time I can wrestle with what I have left. <coughs> Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll be brief. I, I actually just want to follow up Mr. Tierney's line of question with uh, Mr. Allen in, in trying to get an understanding about the, this $250,000. Uh, if I took your answer correctly, um, you're saying that you don't have your hands on this number up to 250000 but what you have done is through the chain of command uh, been informed that every unit that's been issued these has checked all of their suits and have not found any more of the defective manufactured suits. That's correct, sir. So you have pursued it. Multiple times, sir. And, and so um, the people out with the individual units have come back are you able to confirm that every unit has responded uh, in, you know, that yes, we've done the review, personally looked at every, what type of communication has come back? We went back through, we went out through the military services and they would be the ones that would, pre, that would certify or if you will, uh, hear from all of their units. Uh, as far as we know, all of their units have reported <laughs> back to them according to the information we have been provided by the military services that we work through their chain of command. Okay. Would any of the other panelists be able to comment further about that aspect of, of the actual checking of, of the suits? Sir, I'll give you personal experience. I, I came to this duty previously being commander of uh, one of our largest fighter wings. Um, we often received um, a very clear instruction to search for a particular lot or a particular suit. We very closely controlled all of these items and uh, we had a very straightforward procedure to go through and then we had a reporting requirement back that I referenced uh, earlier to Mr. Tierney's question and um, through that process we went again I'm speaking from my own experience but right. I would I would uh, be very comfortable betting that other units operated exactly the same way. Given, given that it would be a life preserving uh, kind of like making sure your your gun is well cleaned and, and operating, uh, it would be something we'd be taking very seriously by the people in the front lines. Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, uh, we exercised, again, speaking through the, the wing that I commanded, we exercised often. I have countless hours wearing the equipment, uh, days, and um, all, in every exercise, we always had a series of inputs that would force us through this problem. I can recall in the top, uh, when the Air Combat Command inspector inspected uh, my wing, we had at least three times where we were tasked with a defective something to see if, A, can, can we recognize we have a tasking, B, how did we process it, C, how do we get the young folks out of the wrong stuff and into the right stuff, D, how do we report it and then destroy equipment or pass it where it's supposed to be passed. This is a very routine process in my experience. And, and, the, um, and, and so back to that typical normal process back to DOAs, what you've been told by each of the services is they've done that review and, and my understanding is this specific manufacturer's suit would be clearly identifiable if a suit was looked at. Yes, sir. Uh, there won't be any... Uh, There'd be no question. We identified them by contract number uh, uh, so, so people could easily read the number on the, on the uh, package and identify that suit. Would, would the, uh, the suit itself uh, like if it was... Um, uh, but, uh, let me uh, just... The suit itself is, you, no, that's okay. The suit itself is vacuum packed. And that's got a... It's, it looks like a miniature green duffel bag that's been uh, 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 shrink wrapped. Uh, it's about so big, about so big around, and it has the, in, the contract number on it, and I believe it on has... On that the, individual pack, right? On every individual pack, so right. it would be easily identifiable. Um, is, is it accurate to say what we're asking in the, in to account for the 250000 is asking you to kind of prove the neg a, a negative in, in the sense of if they've been destroyed, you'll never be able to prove you have all 250000 because if you've looked at them, you can say we've looked at all the ones we have, none of those are in the 250000 lots that we're looking for. And so the, the, the best answer you can give is that... Um, 
you know, we've, we've proven that they're not in our possession. That's, you that's can't prove exactly what happened correct. to them. That's exactly correct, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. I think what I'm going to do is uh, have my own uh, full time, so I'll consider that Mr. Uh, Platt's time. Yeah. And we'll go right now to um, uh, Ms. Watson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me apologize for not being here for this part of the panel. But um, I am concerned from the first panel about if we are really prepared. And so let me ask of any one of you that would like to answer, uh, what can our suits do and can they protect against the lethal biological weapons that we believe Saddam Hussein has at the current time? And can we cover the necessary number of troops that will be there on the ground? Uh, Ms. Watson, the, uh, the suits are qualified uh, against a requirement document which specifies what, what the suit or the protective ensemble has to, uh, has to meet as a criteria. That's driven out of a threat analysis uh, looking at uh, a, a broad array of threats. Uh, the, the threat that uh, Iraq might, might present is uh, with, well within the, uh, the operational requirement uh, characteristics of the, uh, of the ensemble, whether that's the, uh, the lightweight ensemble or the, uh, the battle dress overgarment en ensemble. Uh, it's, it's very rigorously tested against it. In fact, the, uh, the criteria were, were developed against the Soviet Union a much more rigorous threat than, uh, than a country like Iraq could present or probably any other country in the world at, uh, at this point in time. So I, I would say emphatically that the, uh, that the suits can, uh, or the protective ensembles can, can meet or exceed any threat that the Iraqis could present uh, when employed by a trained force and, and properly maintained in the, uh, in the use environment. Uh, the quantity of suits that are available uh, if you're speaking specifically uh, against the Iraqi circumstance, yes, uh, the quantities of suits that are available in the inventory, uh, given the likely size of the force that is, has been, you know, talked about at least in the newspapers, uh, let me put it that way, uh, is more than enough to deal with the uh, with the demands of that type of a war fight. I continue to hear it being said that. Saddam Hussein possesses uh, chemicals and biological weapons that are deadly, and he has used them on his own people. Uh, let me say that in light of what we heard from the first panel that did risk assessments, there are 250,000 suits that are missing, and they feel that at this point, uh, there still is risk in terms of the protected suiting. So let me ask this, uh, is it General Bond? Yes, ma'am. Uh, let's just sum everything we've heard this morning and this afternoon. Would you advise the commander, commander in chief uh, to send our troops today into that highly, uh, shall I say, dangerous chemical and biological <coughs> environment that we have been told on a daily basis that is awaiting us? Uh, Ma'am, that's, that's really not my uh, forte right now, but I can give you my personal belief, knowing from my uh, 32 years of experience and uh, extensive uh, two, uh, tours in Korea and dealing with this uh, very acceptable. Uh, yes, acceptable risk, is that I, I feel that uh, we can meet the, the threat that's out there with an acceptable risk. Can we do everything? Uh, we'll never know whether we'll be pre uh, fully prepared. But I know from personal experience the training that we undergo and the training that we have our soldiers and what they're undergoing right now today as they prepare for what the likelihood that we feel that this is one of the most highest criteria of uh, categories of training that they're undergoing and that I feel assured if it was my son or daughter out there that they would be protected. Did we have this technology during the Gulf War? 
Not to the extent that we have. Uh, we've made significant progress from the Gulf War, from where we are today. Uh, could we have gone farther? Yes. Well, you know, there are a lot of things that we could have done knowing what we know today. But my personal experience is, I think, uh, given the information that we had and the way that we have uh, moved forward, I think uh, this, uh, this area of uh, technology and where we've moved, uh, we've moved uh, great strides. I um, have to be constantly reminded that many of the veterans came back concerning of a lowered health condition. I am recalling the Vietnam veterans and Agent Orange and so on. And uh, for years, our government denied that these conditions did exist and might have been a result from biological and chemical warfare. Uh, and uh, anyone that would like to answer, are all of you comfortable with sending our sons and daughters over in this environment with what we have today? Uh, Ms. Watson, I've, I've worn predecessor versions of the current field of equipment more than a dozen times in an immediately lethal environment with nerve agent CERN, older forms of military equipment more than a dozen times in an environment that would have killed you within minutes. And I uh, am absolutely confident that the versions we have in the field now are more than adequate to address the threat with, Ken, without question. Excuse me. Could I quote you? Absolutely. All right. Because it seems to me that our veterans had tremendous trouble and are still having trouble. And I would like my constituents to be assured that, and it will be my constituents that will be on the front line, I guarantee you that, uh, can be assured that when they send their sons and daughters, that their sons and daughters will be well protected and their offsprings in the future. And we're finding that this has not been the case in the past. And for me to support us going in on a preemptive strike, I want to be sure we're not putting, we're already putting our people into harm's way. But I want to be sure the, the side effects of the chemical and biological warfare will not be the deadly touch. Yes, I will quote you. Thank you. I'd like to recognize myself now. I, um, Mr. Allen, I, and, and uh, kind of uh, I consider you both bookends here, Dr. Winnegar as well. Um, I view you as being in charge of the entire chemical biological program of the United States government, uh, defense. Is that the way I should view you? Well, uh, th that's a tremendous responsibility, and, and thank you for the compliment. Um, I, I, I do have I want you to... Just give me a short answer. Tell me your responsibility. If you want to define it more narrowly, do it, but yes. do it fairly quickly. Um, my responsibility is for research, development, and acquisition of chemical and biological defensive equipment. The responsibility for training, uh, et cetera, is uh, that of the services in accordance with their Title X responsibilities. Okay. Uh, Mr. Allen seemed to be passing the ball back to you as it related to inventory. Uh, and I, if I heard him properly in his statement, I, I think he was saying that was your responsibility. Is inventory your responsibility? No, sir, I do not consider it my responsibility. Okay. Um, Mr. Allen, did I hear you incorrectly? Uh, I didn't intend to imply that uh, Ms. Winnegar was responsible for inventory. What DLA is responsible for is for procurement and distribution of these, uh, these items of supply. Uh, and part of that procurement is, is the quality control. And where we have... Well, let me just clarify. Distribution means you put it somewhere and you give it to them. <laughs> In other words, you send it somewhere. There are two levels of distribution, sir. Okay. One level of distribution is in the DLA warehouses that we, uh, where we maintain uh, equipment on behalf of the military services. Okay. Uh, in, our, in the DOD supply depots, if you will. DOD. Uh, yes. Right. And, and that's your responsibility. That, that is our responsibility. There are, there is some portion, portion of this equipment is sent to the uh, deploying services so well, that they can train with it. No, I, I they hear can you. deploy with it, et cetera. And that uh, portion so, of the uh, supplies is the responsibility of the military services. It, so is it your statement that none of the 250,000 potential defective gear is in any of your warehouses? That's correct. Okay. So now what you're basically saying to us is that you sent it out into the field. Is it your responsibility to try to locate it? Uh, 
we, in conjunction with a program manager, have uh, have attempted to locate all of That's that defective what I asked. equipment. That's not what I asked. I didn't ask. I didn't ask whether you've attempted to. Okay. I just want someone to take ownership. You know, in my office, if two people take ownership, no one has ownership. I always make sure that someone has ownership. And um, I found your statement in the beginning and your answers to, to the first questions alarming. And I wanted to jump in, and now I'm, I'm, I've waited my chance. I felt you were very cavalier in your answers, and now I'm trying to understand why it seems so cavalier. I'll also say something to you. I come with a bias. I come with a bias that says, um, you know, I would say to my dad, you know, I, I just didn't remember. You know, and he'd tell me, remember to be home at a certain time. And he said, well, I'll give you a little incentive. Um, if you don't get home by 10 o'clock tomorrow, uh, you can't go out of this house for a month. Now, you know what? That was an incentive. I didn't say I couldn't remember the next time. I, I made sure I remembered. I'm trying to figure out uh, who's responsible and who can provide the incentive. For instance, this may seem extreme, but if I happen to feel and others happen to feel that defective suits are potentially endangering our troops, and we then spread the word out to the field, and the field ignores us, what happens if you said you'd be court-martialed if you ignored it? Um, would, would the field ignore you then? Um, no, I mean, that's pretty extreme, but we, we, we were court-martialing people because they didn't want to take anthrax, even though they knew it would, uh, felt that it, uh, it, would, it would potentially harm them. Um, and so we were willing to be pretty strong when we wanted to be. So um, we had this incentive, this, this, this system of trying to provide rewards. I guess what I'm having a hard time understanding is if you have a dangerous equipment out there, you want to know where it is and you want it out of there. Now, so I want to know... Uh, do you take ownership of the responsibility to make sure we can get this defective equipment? Sir, I, before I answer that, I have to sure. apologize if I uh, gave you the impression that I was being cavalier. That was absolutely not my intent. I take this very seriously. Um, um, I would tell you that 34 years ago, I went in the service, and the chemical suits we wore were ponchos, right. not very protective. <clears throat> On top of that, though, I would tell you that... Um, DLA is not responsible for equipment that is owned by the military services. And once we give equipment to the military services and they use it for training or they use it for deployment... So who is not responsible again? Defense Logistics Agency is not responsible for military equipment that is owned by the military services. Okay. So tell me who is. The military services are responsible for equipment they purchase to okay. use to ex execute okay. their mission. Now, as part of their Title X responsibilities. So. so now I'm going, I'm, I'm going to know that by the book that's true, and I accept that. But the bottom line is uh, you want to make sure they get good equipment, correct? Yes, sir. So you were partly, you before you agency, were partly responsible for giving them defective equipment? Yes, sir. Okay. So th there's got to be some kind of responsibility that, my God, we gave... Uh, yes, sir, there is. So, so I'm going to accept the fact that while technically you don't have responsibility, you, you, you have to feel that you have some obligation here to try to take care of this problem. That's correct, sir. Okay. And, and what I'm trying to then understand is, does, did your answer in the beginning just stem from the frustrations of not feeling as a civilian that you're getting the respect from the military folk that you need in order to have them pay attention to these notices? Uh, no, sir. Again, uh, I obviously conveyed an impression to you that was not intended on my part, right, well, and again, I apologize for that. Um, my answer in the beginning was an attempt to explain that what we are responsible for is the uh, is for procurement and distribution of this this uh, these items of supply, and that where we do store it on behalf of the military services. Let me just say, I'm going to qualify and see if you agree. Your responsibility is to make sure that they get equipment that is supposed to do the DZOB as, as requested by the military, as designed uh, by the military, as created by the manufacturer, and that you, that is your obligation. In other words, not just to get them equipment, but to give them equipment that works, correct? Yes, sir. That okay. is our job. So in this case, the system failed. With Isertex, that's, right. that's correct, it failed. sir. It, it totally failed. And we had 800,000 suits, and we've identified... Uh, you know, uh, 550,000. We got 250,000 to go. Um, now, admittedly, they are the battle dress overgarment, and I'll get into the question of what, who we, what equipment we send into the Middle East. But I just want to know: isn't it fair for me to accept 
that if you are responsible for making sure they get good equipment, and in the end, maybe your predecessor, your two predecessors ago, made sure, didn't make sure that happened, for whatever reason, that you have an obligation to do what, everything you can to make sure they get, that you relocate that bad equipment and get it out of the system. That is our obligation, and I yep. think that we have uh, gone through extraordinary steps to try to meet that obligation on a repeated instances, sir, yep. to include last month, because the fund site that was used to provide the transportation costs to return any, any deficient equipment they might have found had expired, we on our own went out again to renew that fund site to, and again taken another opportunity to remind them to check their equipment and make sure it was not part of the Isratex equipment and return it to us if it was so done and return it to us at no cost to them, in fact, for replacement. Yeah. We've, we've done as, as much as we could yeah, do me, to incentivize them. Let me just, let me just to ask this. In, in cases like this, the no cost, I mean, I think that's good. I mean, in other words, everybody's looking at their bottom line. But my mind would be, my God, this is bad equipment. It could endanger our troops. If I was in the military, I would think you wouldn't need any incentive. Um, you just need the command to make sure that, that people down a little further know. Mr. Allen, I'd be happy to let you ask some questions if you'd like, and then take my time. I'd like to, I don't want you to feel you have to leave if you have to run out. I, I do have to leave, but I don't mind. I've given a question okay. to Jan Schadowski, okay. and Thank she you. can handle it for me. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Um, with regard to the, the, the joint list, we have the battle dress overgarment, and in there are potentially zero to 250. Obviously, it's going to be less than 250,000, but it could be 100,000, it could be 50,000, it could be 20,000. We want to make sure, even if it's 2,000. We want to make sure that it's zero because we don't want 2,000 going into to the Correct. Middle East. My understanding is the 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 uh, the Joint Service Lightweight Integrated Service Technology suits that we have. We wanted four main, and we've done how many now? We have uh, 150. I'm sorry. Uh, One million five hundred thousand suits in our possession, okay. uh, and another uh, eight hundred thousand suits on order. Right. currently being manufactured. Well, I would think that someone would want to, to ascertain and say with all commitment, and I would like to think that someone would have been given the, the um, permission to say what would have to be the truth. Wherever these 1,500 uh, really high technology suits that other countries want to use, wherever they are in the field, we would collect them and make sure that they will be the only ones used uh, in the Middle East. I would like to think that. Would that be illogical for me to make an assumption that that should happen? No, sir. No, I, I think that's a perfectly valid assumption as we plan for these types of contingencies that, that we can readjust uh, the inventory, if you will, and move uh, existing suits from units that won't need them to those that will. Well, one of the things that I think this committee should do is we should contact the Department of Defense and have an ironclad uh, uh, agreement that none of the battle uh, that the battle dress overgarments will be used that uh, uh, and that any that are used we are certain are not part of the 250,000 uh, defective equipment I would think that would be like a no-brainer for us and um, mr. Allen do you want to say something no I, I uh I certainly understand that uh, perspective. I would agree with that perspective. Uh, it's a department. Uh, okay, one last question. Do we have the capability to, uh, if we need, uh, we had 700,000 troops. I don't think we would have that many in Iraq this time if we do, in fact, go in. One of the but improvements. Do we have the capability to, to, um, to bring together uh, 500,000 of these suits? One of the improvements we have made since our last hearing on this subject is the absolutely we have the capability to identify the suits. In fact, within the DLA warehouses, we have more than 500,000 of these suits we're storing on behalf of the services. So we could put our hands on those specific suits and make sure those were the ones that were issued. We have established some positive controls and, uh, since uh, the uh, Isratex was sent to the field. And I would like to think that, that you would take ownership of the fact that you have these in your possession and you would want to make sure that these are the only suits that get out, unless I don't know something in the battle a dress overgarment uh, has a function that the uh, the J list doesn't that is needed. But if 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 the joint list uh, suit is going to do the job, 
I would think that's the only suit that would be there. Yeah, the JS list suit is a, the way we commonly refer to that, sir. The JS list suit uh, uh, would be the one of choice in all likelihood, and that would be the one we would issue unless there were, we were specifically instructed to do otherwise, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the patience. Mr. Sikowski, you could have 10 minutes times whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the chairman for so re relentlessly pursuing this issue, which has become heightened in its importance given the fact that we may actually be in a, in a state of, uh, of war, though I hope that can be uh, avoided. Um, I uh, have been not only a part, um, as a member of this committee participating in hearings like this, but also as the ranking Democrat on the Government Efficiency Subcommittee. I want to quote you something that um, was said by a uh, licensed practical nurse that's been in Afghanistan. This is a quote from a, new, a Los Angeles Times article. He says, if Hussein used chemical or biological weapons, quote, He'd be an idiot, unquote, said Staff Sergeant John Hughes, a 38-year-old licensed practical nurse who returned from a seven-month seven stint in Afghanistan in mid-July. Quote, I don't think it'd be a problem. It's something that the infantry, infantry trains on all the time, unquote. It is with that sort of confidence that our enlisted men and women have that they would be going into harm's way in danger of biological and chemical weapons. But I want to tell you, after sitting in these hearings, both this subcommittee and my subcommittee, and hearing essentially the Keystone Cop way that we've been handling inventory and these defective suits, I would hate for our men and women in the armed services to, to know about that because this would damage their attitude. And I want to talk to you about a, a couple of things that I, I still have been, been hearing that, don't, that still don't give me the kind of confidence. Um, you said, Mr. Allen, that we know the contract and lot numbers, and so we can find these suits. And yet the GAO stated that the D DOD could not easily identify, track, and locate defective suits because inventory records do not always include contract and lot numbers. Are they mistaken or are you? Uh, what the, GA, uh, what the uh, GAO and the IG uh, correctly identified is at the unit level. Uh, there, is a, there is not a consistent inventory management system. And one of the IG's firm findings and recommendations to this panel and to the DOD was to establish an inventory management system at the unit level that included all that information. At the wholesale level, we do have that information so we are able to maintain those controls at that level. At the unit level, what they're talking about oftentimes is at many post camps and stations that are training in a regular environment. In some cases, they're talking about gear that's on a ship at sea. That is, people deploy with, uh, with, um, with gear it, because they may need it while they're, uh, while they're deployed. And it's at that level where the lacking of inventory management system uh, is, where well, they pointed that Well, not only an inventory management system, but according to the Inspector General, not all units have received the information from their higher headquarters about the suits. And as recently as April 2002, the IG continued to identify units that had not segregated those defective BDOs in their inventories. I, uh, I, Is that so? I can't question the IG's findings. We were not given that report until uh, yesterday afternoon. I'd like to have the specifics of that so that we could follow up with that to determine if something happened in our procedures and our processes, we can make the corrections for the future. I was not aware of that until yesterday afternoon, so but I you, cannot address it But a few minutes point. ago, you asserted that we did, and I think that it's at least important that we acknowledge the problem fully in order to, to be able to correct it. And just a few minutes ago, you uh, asserted that, in fact, all these units have been informed and that we're going to be able to, to find the, these suits. So, I, you know, please, I hope you will be making sure that every single unit is, is aware of, of them. Um, inven the issue of inventory control, even on the new suits, we had testimony, I think it was in, in the uh, Government Efficiency Subcommittee, that inventory control ranged from having information on a computer system to having it on erase boards. And you know how long-lasting that is. So the question of even being able to identify where the 1.2 million or however many 
working suits that, that we have seems to be a problem, and yet you seem very confident that we could call up the necessary number of, of suits that we know where they are. And I don't feel as confident. You know, if we're talking about erase boards, who knows where they could be? And you're talking about on-ship. Uh, what are we doing to centralize and, and reform this inventory control system so that we really do know where they are? Before the gentleman answers, I just, I just want to, for the record, point out that was our hearing on inventory control in June. Uh, and we used as an example uh, the suits. Uh, we used as an example the very issue we're doing right now. So it's kind of like we're doing the reverse. First we did inventory and then talked about the suits. Now we're talking about the suits and we're talking about inventory. Yeah, I think government um, efficiency, though, also looked at inventory yeah, control, not, regard, not just regarding the defective suits, right. but now the new suits, no, yeah, right. knowing where they are. Yeah, no, we, the hearing was on the pathetic nature of how we keep inventory on a whole host right. of issues, not just the suits. Right. Yeah. So what are we doing to make sure that we know where the new ones are, the good ones are? Based on the last hearing a couple of years ago, the uh, program manager in the military services took responsibility uh, to, um, and in part be driven by the committee here, to establish and report annually on the inventory status of those suits. That is a manual process at some part at this point. Uh, in some part it is automated. I must make a distinction uh, in between the wholesale level uh, inventory management and the visibility and the automation level we have at the, at the DLA and at the Army level from the uh, inventory management capability at the unit level. But isn't that what we care about? Isn't it at the unit level that we fight a war? We keep, uh, we keep suits and can supply suits at both levels. So uh, yes, we care about the uh, unit level, but we also care about at the, uh, at the wholesale level. And we do have much better capability, which we are expanding. In fact, I believe during the June hearing that the program manager, Mr. Bryce, outlined a test program he was going to institute to get visibility of suits as they pass to an operating level unit within the Marine Corps. Uh, he also testified, and it was part of my written record, that we are establishing a, an enterprise resource planning system which we will make available to link to all the services inventory records uh, <laughs> as a way to get a handle on this inventory from top to bottom. So we're we are doing not there annual yet. testing? We are doing annual testing. We are doing annual reporting, some portion of which is manual. And does this kind of system apply to other inventory, or, or, or now you're just responding to the committees, both subcommittees, focus on suits? Uh, no, this kind of system would apply to all inventories uh, eventually, but one of the issues is that suits are probably, or chemical protective gear is more important perhaps at this point than some other uh, equipment which might not be so uh, life protecting. Well, let me ask you about the. It, extent to which they're life protecting. I understand that there's Navy SEALs who are concerned because the suits don't work if there's salt water on them. Is that the case? Uh, the, the, uh, one of the operating requirements for these suits, the JS list suit, was to be uh, to operate in, in a salt mist environment. Uh, if you immerse it in salt water, it, no, it does not uh, protect if it, there's immersion. But it does, uh, it does protect in a uh, in a normal operating environment at sea where it's raining or it's uh, misting. Are you concerned that in the Gulf region that th this might put some of our people at least in harm's way if it's not, uh, if salt water itself, not they, mist but water, the, would make the suits um, ineffective? The, I don't believe the JS list suits would ever be used by SEALs in their salt water mission environments. Uh, the SEALs are, uh, I think what you're referring to is the SEALs are operating uh, underwater and the JS list suits were not intended for use underwater. So you're not concerned that the salt water issue is a, is a problem? Uh, the service is, it did not make that a requirement for uh, one of the technical requirements for the suit. Okay. And they, have, they, they build the requirement based upon the threat they expect to face. Could the general lady yield a second? Yes. I mean, uh, uh, really, Mr. Uh, general, sorry, um, General Goldfein, this is your, you basically try to determine what you need, and, and General Bond, you try to determine uh, how you make it, and, 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 and so couldn't both of you also answer that question? I that think. would be helpful. Well, it would be interesting to find out what the Navy uh, and the Special Operation Forces had uh, requested uh, to 
support uh, the SEAL's mission in this endeavor. Uh, the J-List suits were never intended for this. They may have a special purpose one, or this may be a new evolving requirement for which we are going to now get a requirement. Uh, we'll supersede through while we waited through the formal process to now find a way to, uh, to satisfy this one. Uh, there are mechanisms, I think, that uh, the science and technology c have that would allow us to make a suit that that's, would withstand this. And there is a specific uh, undergarment which is designed for the special operating forces, including the SEALs, which has a uh, rather extraordinary uh, range of applications in, extreme, in extremely uh, severe operating environments, which would be suitable for the for the you know the use that I think you're uh, uh, animating in your questioning, the, and that is available to the SEALs. Uh, the JS list was never intended for that type of an operating environment. Do you all feel confident that we know where enough of the non-defective suits are right now, so that they can be immediately put to use in a combat situation in in, in Iraq? I think. Unequivocally, yes. And you're certain that none of the defective suits would end up being used in that way? When you ask me I am, if I am certain, I cannot be unequivocal about that. I have a high degree of confidence there would be no defective suits utilized in that for a number of reasons, partly because of what we've been through to identify and call out the defective suits, partly because of what the chairman mentioned which, which would be the sinks would want to use the new suits. And we know we can identify those suits. So unequivocally, we could equip the force that is envisioned today with good suits and knowing with, with virtual assurity that they are all good suits. I just have to say that I think um, <coughs> addressing some of these incredible inefficiencies at this, at this late date, while it's important that, that we do it, um, would really astound most Americans, I think, the fact that, that we don't have a better handle on something as basic as these protective suits. But I am happy to hear that uh, even though it's so late that we are trying to get a handle on it and that at the next hearing we will have a full report about where these 250,000 defective suits are and that we have an inventory system <coughs> capable of tracking all these life-saving, at the very least, um, e equipment that our young men and women need. Thank you. Thank you. We, we prepare questions beforehand and usually they're covered by different members, but these two questions haven't been to, uh, I think, our satisfaction. We want them on the record so whether I'm chairman a year from now or someone else, another party, whatever, uh, we have uh, uh, this on the record so we can have a benchmark. And I, I think really, uh, General Goldfein, it may be in your area, I would ask how will the establishment of the Joint Program Executive Office improve the CB defense requirement process? That's the way you stated the question, Mr. Chairman, is a bit of a mixture in our in, in sort of the way we describe. Okay, I'm going to ask you another question, and you decide how, which one you want to answer first, or whether you want to exchange. How will the establishment of a joint program executive office improve the CB material acquisition process? Yes, sir. Um, I'm going to defer to General Bond and the joint program executive because that would be his okay. business. I will, however, though, if I can help, I'll answer on the requirements sure. side, and I'll make a couple of comments. First of all. Having a counterpart, a joint program executive, to match with me as a, as the director for joint requirements is a good thing, and we should work. We should be joined at the hip. We should work hand in hand. In other words, I should I should do the work to establish the requirement. For example, um, uh, earlier the the comment was made about seal equipment. If right. there's a need, it should I should have a I should have a good system that will bring that need to my attention. I would then hand that responsibility to the program executive and ask that he go forward and, and, for example, purchase an item. And I'm making this overly simple. Sure, I understand. And we ought to work closely hand in hand, and I should be aware whether or not he accomplished that task, because then I know whether or not that requirement is, is, uh, has been met. And so I guess my answer to your question would be the joint program executive, from my perspective as the requirements person, uh, is, is an important office, an important advantage, and, and the two of us should work, and we intend to, hand in hand. I'd, I'd prefer to defer to General Bond with regard to the specifics of that office. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, 
in my prior job for the last two years, I was on the requirements and was the counterpart for the Army that uh, worked up through the JROC process to validate requirements. Uh, it was not with uh, malice or forethought that the Chief or the Secretary moved me to this position now where I now take the requirements and now have responsibility for delivering actual <laughs> performance. In that venue, the issue that, uh, that General Goldstein talks about is, is really clear because we need to work very closely. He identifies requirements. I need then to tell him what really technology, along with the Mr. Parker, is really achievable within the time frames that they want. We don't want to set the bar too high for which then our soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen are waiting and waiting and waiting for that <coughs> capability out there. Uh, but the same thing, he wants to challenge us to make sure we give the best possible capability out there for soldiers. We need to do that in, in a, in a uh, joined at the hip manner in which we make sure we get the best capability out there. So we're going to work this together and uh, we'll continue to do that in the future. And it's not that way right now? That, that, it wasn't. That's, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. That is why the, uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Undersecretary for Acquisition Technology and Logistics collectively arrived at a position that said we need to come up to a better way, which is what generated this office I indicated to you earlier, which we've just started. Super. Thank you. That's very helpful information. Is there anything in this public part of this hearing that you want to put on the record. But Mr. Chairman, yes, I didn't do justice to Mr. Allen's questions. Can I ask them briefly? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, he's a, it is my understanding that after five years, I think this is an old rule, not a new rule, suits are supposed to be tested for defects annually. Is that correct? I think what you're referring to is uh, the shelf life extension program. We have a, a joint shelf life extension program on all chemical equipment. Uh, and uh, we set the timing on each piece of equipment differently according to its lifestyle. So have you been four doing suits, that annual? Four suits at the, every, at the fifth year, we test it for shelf life extension, and we test it again at... Um, well, uh, have you been I, doing I, the five year? Yes, we've been doing the five. I think it's five, nine, 12, and 14 year, and we extend it up to 14 years if it passes the test. Mr. Allen's question was, does the Pentagon have the paperwork demonstrating that it has conducted annual testing on all suits that have extended past their recommended shelf life? Yes, we do, uh, especially since two years ago. We, we, really, we really tightened up that process as a result of the problems we experienced two years ago and as, partly as a result of this committee's hearing then. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I just want to make sure since uh, we, we're trying to be precise here. Yes, sir. So we tightened up a system where we didn't have it. So there may have been some in the past where we weren't doing it. And your response to, to, to um, the question from Mr. Sikowski on behalf of Representative Allen is that uh, from, this, from a period of two years ago on, you have started this paperwork. No, I wasn't clear. We always did the testing. I don't know that the documentation was as clean and as proper as it is now. And one of the reasons we did that so, is so that we could provide some assurance that there would be uh, no, no defective suits going to any soldiers. Uh, and we, uh, we do that according to all equipment at this point. Okay. Let me um, ask you, is there anything else that anyone wants to put on the record in this open hearing? We are going to adjourn. Uh, we are going to start sharp at 25 after. It gives about 13 minutes. If you want to quickly, uh, on, the, on the basement level, there's... Uh, I think you can get something to eat if you want to just get something to drink. And we will um, resume the hearing uh, at, at the other site um, uh, uh, behind closed doors. That, that uh, you all are sworn in. It's just a continuation. And frankly, we may just put all of you together so we can have a, 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 an, an interactive dialogue. But it will be uh, by 25 after at the, at the next site. You need to get some meat. Yes. So this hearing, this hearing is adjourned until 225. With just over a month before Election Day, C-SPAN continues to show you debates from around the nation. Our weekly Friday night lineup begins tonight at 8 Eastern.